Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. Okay, so tonight on the Barbarian Hour, we are going to have one of the best to ever do it in the state of Ohio. Former, wait, is it, is it, is it former yet? Are you the former head coach of Valeria yet? Is the, is the, uh, is the resignation in or, or, or not? I don't know. I mean, as I was loading up coolers tonight with pop and Gatorades and ice for our Lorain County All-Star match tomorrow night, I guess I would consider myself still head coach at least till tomorrow night. So we're 24 hours roughly away from Eric Burnett being the former head coach of the Illyria Pioneers. Was 97 your first year or 96? 97. That so ni- 1997 was your first year would have been was it oh it was false so it was jack gillespie senior year your your yeah, right yeah, hand I, man I, I had coach jack he was a senior that year okay was chidlaw a year older then was he out i want to say yeah he might have been he might have been a year out maybe two okay okay so those well, he those was are two years. wait no he might have been yeah maybe one year i think he was one year older than scott okay. so he was probably 97 yeah so those are two of your assistants, right? Yes, sir. Is everybody on the staff who's like the core guys, are they all Lyria grads? Yeah, we had a year there where we had one other guy that was not, but everybody on our staff is an Lyria grad other than myself. Okay, so just to give the quick, the intro is not even done here yet. The soon-to-be former head coach of the Lyria Pioneers going on 25 years. Well, it was 25 years for Eric Burnett. Uh, coach of the year, Coaches Association Coach of the Year. Um, the uh, You guys have been, is it six time? Six, six top two finishes, is that correct? We, we, yeah, we got five, five trophies in the case. Five, five trophies in the case. Yeah, yeah. Three at the individual state tournament, two with the duels. Three and two. Okay. So the uh, – Pioneers have had a lot of success. And your first state champ, your first state finalist was Andrew Perez. Is that correct? Yeah, that was in uh, 03. 03, okay. And then your first champ was Danny Mitchell? Danny Coach Mitchell. Danny, assistant coach, All-American for the Kent State Golden Flashes, Mitchell. Yes, and sir, then 05. You've had a lot of, lot of great athletes since then. Um a couple of division one, all Americans, you got some guys wrestling in Detroit. Well, I know at least one in Detroit with, um, uh, army West point senior, uh, JT Brown, right. Yeah. And Dylan Shaver for uh, Rutgers at 125. Dylan Shaver, the 125 pounder for the Rutgers the Scarlet Knights. Yeah. Um, we had two guys last week. Um, yeah, we had Matt Zuckerman and Bryce, uh, Bryce Allison, uh, Russell for Tiffin and the uh, D2 nationals. How did week. they do? Um, I think Bryce lost in the uh, blood round and uh, Matt went one and two. Okay. So they're right there. They got years left too, don't they? Oh yeah. Yeah. They got a long time. It's good. It's, it's real cool. So coach Burnett was a four-time state champion in Ohio, the seventh four-time state champ or the, or the fifth. I forget. Technically I was a fourth. Fourth because yeah, was what happened was just, wait. there was three year, your senior year, right? Yeah. You Ken Ramsey and. Um, yeah, Danny Hanson from uh, Danny, Richmond Heights. Richmond Heights, okay. 
So there were three. I remember that because that was like the first time there was multiple, right? Yes. Yeah, because there were three in like the 40-year history prior to that. I think it was like 40-some years. So the three. And our yeah, first and four-time state champ was uh, Zimmer. Yeah, Zimmer and then, um, um, and then Jim Jordan and Jeff Jordan. Jim, Jeff, Jim and Jeff Jordan, Zimmer, who recently passed away in the last couple of years. I know that, like probably in the last two years. Um, he had uh, uh, MLS, didn't he? I believe. What's that? I believe he had uh, the uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, didn't he? I think so, yeah. What, yeah. what a tragic thing. But he's our first four-time state champ from Columbus to Sales. And then the Jordan brothers, and then you're you're the fourth. Wow, what a what a, I did not realize. I knew you had three that year because you and my brother fur to the same age, you know. So yeah. okay, so four time state champ Eric Burnett, and then your college wrestling was done in Clarion, Pennsylvania, a little burg in Western PA, right by the Cooks Forest, right? Yeah, yeah, about twenty five minutes from there. <clears throat> So you went there in 88, uh, 87, 88 would have been your first season, but you didn't have a season that first season, did you? Yeah, no, I was a prop because uh, basically our, my, our high school singlets had an O on the front of it. It probably should have been representative of my grade point average in my first couple of years of high school, um, unfortunately. Yeah, my grades weren't where they needed to be. You tell that story a lot, actually. My, the one that really sticks out to me, Eric, is when you were at the Brexville the one year and Dave Schultz was there recruiting. Mm -hmm. and, and Dave Schultz being Dave Schultz, was you saw him, right? And you, and you guys you had a conversation. What did Dave Schultz say to you at the Brexville in 1986? I mean, he was really friendly, obviously. I mean, it, you just, you know, great, great guy. But, yeah, very honest, you know. Um, they the, co the the head coach Andy Ryan had already been at my house. They had recruited, uh, they had recruited me, and um, you know, but they but but you know, Coach Schultz was like, hey, you know, best of luck. Hopefully things go well for you. We're not going to be recruiting you. You're, you're basically he basically said I was a high risk, you know, academically. And he said absolutely right, you know. So um, so yeah, I mean, great guy. Obviously was did, meant no wasn't disrespectful at all to me. Um, I, I still think the think the world of them. I mean, to this day, but they were right, you know. Um, was that so the yeah, first time? Is that the first time it hit you? Kind of though. Is that the first time? Was that the first time reality kind of set in? I think the irony of it was that I was actually doing better my senior year. I mean, think the academically things were. You know, back then you were getting recruited in your senior year. You know what I mean? Now it's not necessarily the case, but um, you know, it, yeah, it was um. Yeah, you know, I, and I knew I knew I had dug myself a hole, which basically was the reason why I was doing better at that point, you know. Um, but yeah, it was I, I needed to basically I, I needed to have like all eights my senior year, like H's and stuff like that, <laughs> like you know, like <laughs> A plus pluses. <laughs> you, know, to, to, you needed to, get to go to all. Show. Listen, I have some students who are very driven students where I where I teach, and they they want. I have students with hundred percent in classes who want more they want more they're so driven they want more and they'll be like is there anything that we can do as far as you know extra credit and i'm like yeah here's a, you know you know like i want to help kids like that out but like you <laughs> these people want to get above the four they want the 4.5 i think is the big thing they want because if it's weight right the weighted scale yeah um, yeah and all their stuff's honors, and I understand you. You just needed that. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, to get I was just trying to. Hit the two, I was trying to hit the two O, baby. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what can I do to get up? You know, I, hey, I got a seventy-eight. How do I get an eighty-one? I uh, here, man. Yeah. Well, the irony nice. of it all too is, is your dad was such a big driving force. Ron Burnett was such a big part of. Your dad and my dad are these blue collar, hard nosed dudes. Your dad was a steel worker. My dad's an iron worker. We're, there's a big difference. My dad's structural steel, and they build they wreck buildings and bridges, right? Your dad was in the plant that makes all the stuff that my dad builds stuff with, right? Yeah. And his big thing was, don't do this. You don't need to do this, right? Wasn't that Ron's big thing? Yeah, I mean, he loved his job. 
I mean, he loved it. He was, he was down there for 30 years. He loved being a machinist. Um, but, you know, one, I mean, you know your kids, right? And, you know, when he sees me trying to swing a hammer or trying to help fix the lawnmower and whatnot, and, I, you know, I did, I was terrible. Like, the guy would try to teach me stuff, and I'd be like, what? It, the hammers, it must be for lefties. I don't know how to, it won't swing right. You know, it's, 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 he knew. You know? Why set yourself up for misery, you know? what I mean so he felt like and he knew I was going to coach I mean you know by the time I was in college and I was working the clarion wrestling camps and stuff like that and coming home and working with my brother he knew I was going to you know and that was the thing he's like don't you want to have some kind of a location where that where you can you can be around your kids and you can jump on the mat when you want to and, and you know so so you know what I'm saying he knew you know he knew me your dad was really really good as a youth coach and that's kind of the whole isn't that where the whole connection between the Burnettes and the Stevers is from didn't Ron coach them in youth wrestling yeah I mean he um oh man yeah so when I moved back from Pennsylvania it was in 94 and so he had he had when when Marty Spann when he passed away um he, he had been the West Shore coach and my dad had jumped in there and helped him out even when I was at West Shore and then by the time my brother came through you know, my, my dad had taken over, you know, uh, Coach Marty Spann had passed away at that point. And so when I moved back in 94, they, they were still going strong. Um, they were, they were at Westlake high school, I think at that point. And then when I started coaching at Amherst, my dad moved the program over there and West shore continued to, to operate. They continued to wrestle. And when we went, when we were at Amherst, my dad moved um, their program over to Amherst and they called it, the North Coast Wrestling Club. Um, and we were at Amherst for two years. And then when I went to Elyria, then they went over to Elyria. And then shortly thereafter, Jim and Donna Pycraft uh, decided that they were going to build the barn out in LaGrange. Did they so, make them better than the Pycrafts, by the way? Uh, no. It's absolute salt of the earth, man. Some of the like, best people I've ever met. We'll, we'll yeah. get in. We'll come. We're going to circle back around to them, but. Ron took the North Coast Wrestling Club, which eventually yep. evolved into All American Wrestling Club. I think we called it All American when we were at Elyria, and okay. we were there for one year, and then we built the barn. And I use the term "we" very loosely because I just I tried to help build the barn without like ruining it. But <laughs> Jim and Donna were very patient with me. Um, uh, as long as I had the right-handed nail gun and not the left-handed <laughs> nail gun, it was fine. <laughs> Um, Everything was left-handed for Eric Burnett, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. It sucked, man. I, you know, all these tools Dude, didn't you get, get me right. It's funny because that is how I was. You know, and my dad. I remember my dad told me at like a young age. He's like, "Son, you're gonna want to get an education because if you try and do this, you're gonna starve." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's like I, yeah, people get like uh, kind of soft skinned about things. I'm not because I was I was uh, I was luckily blessed with a very brutally honest father, yeah, <laughs> and and a grandfather and a bunch of uncles and brothers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Could be yeah. thin skinned in my house, but you know your dad obviously did a good job. But so so where did eventually was the final spot for the club where Ron was running practice was at Piecrafts? Yeah, and that's where the that's where the the Stever connection. I believe I believe it happened there. I think, um, but he was working back now. Then I was with junior high kids, right? My dad had his two youth nights, and he, he would so those were his nights exclusively. And I lived there, but I was running Elyria youth practices, right? When we took over the Elyria program, the, the the youth program had faded away, so we had to restart that. So my dad was working with these advanced kids, you know, I mean, more advanced than the kids that I was working with in Elyria. And um, what happened was once they hit like sixth grade, then they would jump into my workouts. And so my dad was telling me about the, these Stever kids and the Tassaris and the Phillips and whatnot. You know, you know how it is. You're like, you know, I'm, I'm primarily coaching high, high school. I got some junior high kids coming out. And I'm like, eh, hey, Chief Russell. I'm like, yeah, I will see how good they are, you know. Um, and I, and I should have, my, my dad was talking about these kids. He's like, I'm telling you, we may never see anything like this again, you know. And, um, 
yeah, sure enough. Once, um, once we were able to get together with, with, uh, with those, with that group, um, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was amazing. I don't uh, think he was lying or exaggerating. Do you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crazy because Logan Stieber affected an entire generation, obviously pos- positively. Mm-hmm. He affected an entire generation. You know, my nephew Ian, right? You mm-hmm. look at Salzer. You look at all those guys out of Northeast Ohio that they sharpened their skills off of Logan Stieber. Think about it, right? It was, he's a generational well, talent, what I like to say, right? Yeah, and, and here's the thing. like we, That group was amazing. And a lot of them weren't exclusively, you know, BTW or All-American or EBW or whatever, you know. Um, but – you know, people like to work out with the best. In, in Stevers, I would say, were pretty much exclusively BTW, with the exception of in the summertime, they would go down with, with Jeff Jordan. Yeah. Um, why and, wouldn't which you? I thought, and why well, wouldn't you? It was, it was perfect. Yeah. I, I just felt like it was a, it was a great combination. And um, But as far as club-wise, I feel like, you know, they, they were in our club. And, and, um, but then you got – then they would draw guys in. You know, guys wanted to come in and wrestle them. And, you know, we had guys like Bradley Wilkie and, and you know, uh, Big House, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, Harrison Hightower, um, Bradley Squire, Kagan Squire. Um, you know, uh, the, the Palmers would go from West Shore. They'd kind of go back and forth, but they were in the room. Um, Ian Miller. Uh, we, it was just an amazing group. Jamie and it was Clark. Group. Jamie, Jamie Clark. Clark. Yeah. Oh, my heavens. Yeah, Jamie Clark. I mean, and then Jamie, him and his dad would ride up and they would bring Sammy with them, Sammy White. Sammy you know, White. He would come in for workouts. And, of course, we had Stevie Mitchell, Danny Mitchell. Um, we had our guys, you know, um, Andrew Perez. I mean, it was like th- there was a group of kids that at, at some points that place was bursting. Who There'd the be West 50 Lake kids kid? out there. Nick. Uh, oh yeah, Nick. Nick Lawrence. Nick, Nick Lawrence. Lawrence was nails, dude. Before he got injured, he went to Purdue. That dude was real good. Yeah. Salzer. Yeah. Salzer yeah. was in there. Yeah. Yeah. Dempsey, another Westlake did, kid. Did Julius. Uh, Johnny to Julius. Yeah. Yeah. John, Johnny and Ty Mitch. They came yeah. to camps more yeah, so. Ty Mitch. But sometimes on Sundays, you know, dude, they would we could come sit out here and Sunday. just keep Fickle. Fickle was around. Oh, he was around forever. Fickle yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, Zane, Zane, Zane Zeman. Yeah, Zane Zeman, yeah. Your high it, school it was, coaches, your high school coaches, grandson wrestled at Minnesota and was a state runner up to Bo Jordan. Zane yeah. Zeman. I remember the old man, your, 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 I can't wait to hear the story about the cookie in his pocket. I remember one day he got out of his truck and he drove this like little truck, right? And he's dropping Zane off and he just doored my car so hard. And he didn't yeah. think anything of it. And he's just like, yeah. so it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Z was awesome, man. He was a good dude, real good dude. I liked him. He, but whatever, I don't care. My car was a piece of crap anyway. But well, he would like he would like roll these cars, right? Like he, so he had this caddy. He had this sweet ass caddy that he kept in the garage for the winter time. So he'd roll like these like four maybe four hundred dollar cars around in the winter. And when I was a freshman, like he'd just leave his keys laying around, man. So he'd be in the coach's office and we'd shower and whatnot. And one of the kids on the team would need a ride home. And, and Z would be like, all right, wait, just wait. We'll get out of here. Well, I would steal his keys. And I'm like 14 years old. And I'm driving dudes all over Oberlin. And, you know, I'd get back there and he'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <sighs> so, you know, he'd get, he'd get pretty pissed. But he was cool. You know, he wasn't like he was ringing my dad up like, hey, your kid's an a-hole, whatever. He, you know, he – he was cool. And I became really good friends with his son, Kent. And Kent was in my grade. And Avon started a wrestling team in, like, 11th grade. And Kent Zeman basically started wrestling in 11th grade and was a match from going to state his senior year. Are you serious? I mean, yeah, man. No, it was crazy. Um, Dude, this, you just got all these families that you've gravitated, gravitated to, right? And mm-hmm. you always seem to gravitate to really good people. But, like, this is total – like this is the luck of the draw essentially because the guy's your high school wrestling coach and he's got this, you know, he's got this kid who's the same age as you, right? Who doesn't even go to your school. Right. And how, you know, like how lucky did you get those people coming into your life? Just think about that. And it was just, it was Dude, your I, coach. I, 
I spent, I spent so many weekends at my coach's house. You know what I mean? And, and, and don't get me wrong. Kent, Kent and I were buddies, man. And, and Knipper, you know, my best friend in high school, like Kent and Chris were friends. Like we, you know, but, and Avon was a lot different then than it is now. It was a little small community. It was whatnot. rural. It was mostly it was rural. rural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just had, me and Kent had a lot of fun. I'll just put it that way. We had, we had a lot of fun. But Z, like, I could just go over there, and he, he was like a family member, man, you know. And, and you, you know how you pick up, it's, I don't know, what is it, osmosis? You pick up on that. Yeah. You know, Put the book underneath your pillow to study. It sounds like that's what you did a lot. The barn first, right? You, you try, did you try and do What's the that? studying thing? Like you, but it didn't work for you, right, in high school? Not so much. You mean with the book under my yeah, pillow? Yeah, the no. book under the pillow. That's osmosis, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I basically ruined a lot of books with the saliva. Like, I just drew all just over out of the, the Hey, they don't have to worry about that anymore. All their books are online. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, <laughs> unless I sleep with my head on the Chromebook, which, yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> okay, so your dad, back to your dad, you know, he ran this club, and, you know, you had a really – you had a great, you know, high school experience, obviously, but your dad was the – he was – Ron Burnett never wrestled. Is that correct? Correct. But he, like, had a love for it. He went to Vietnam. He was a United States Marine. And he just – what gravitated Ron Burnett? Because he's from Elyria, correct? Yes. What gravitated yeah. Ron Burnett? Oh, one other name. We forgot another one of his youth – guy he coached in youth was Dustin Kilgore, by the way. Yeah, pretty good wrestler there. <laughs> yeah. Stepanovich, Alex Stepanovich. Stepanovich, the NFL guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mark um, Moe's. Moe, yeah. they're like really good guys. Like he said some really, really, really good guys. And it's like a who's who. And, and they, they will credit Ron Burnett with, man, that guy did everything for me. Because he was tough. He was tough. Yeah. And he taught, he taught great basics. But I think we all know the greatest basic that, that Ron Burnett liked it was, it was a barrel roll, right? He liked inside ties, man. He liked working from an inside tie. Yeah, barrels, carries. Yep. Yeah. Snap like, downs. Snap downs, real big on short offense. And that that's kind of where he – that inside tricep tie, where it's like everything Jordan's – a lot. well, what Jordan's original system was was predicated off a of collar tie, right? Mm -hmm. And – and um, Yeah, I mean, all, all good, right? All oh, good. yeah, there's no – we're not judging yeah. here, right? Yeah, but everything right. you guys do was – every, everything the Burnett train system is inside tri – Tie tricep tie, which obviously both of you have evolved, and you got to do other stuff. You can't just be like, oh no, only collar ties. Only, you can't do that, right? You well, have, I mean, it has to be, you know, stylistically, it's got to match up with the kid too. Correct, and it's like it would be like if you told Ben Darmstead he couldn't do cradles. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or he right. couldn't do that assassins. It would be like you're taking his arsenal away from him. Well, yeah, I think Ben. I think Ben prides himself on doing one barrel roll. At some point, a couple of years ago, he's like, I hit a barrel roll this one time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your guy from, you get my point, like from, you brought yeah. that guy up from, I mean, I think at some point in time, you might even been taller than him. You've been coaching him that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had him. I think he was in about fourth grade. I had him by a half an inch. <laughs> <laughs> We're not joking about this, by the way. No, no. How about the junior high state tournament? The picture, they took a picture of you coaching him for third and fourth. And Bar Ben Darmstadt was like a whole – dude, he was this much taller than you as, as an yeah. eighth grader. Yeah. So so seventh grade was a rough year for him, man, because he was going through some gross things and, like, his growth pattern, it was it was not. Um, I think the one year he actually had to wear these, like, his – Elliot, his dad was – he would he would call him Forrest Gump because he wore these braces on his legs and it – they look like the ones that Forrest Gump basically ran out of when he was being chased by, yeah. the, by the bully on the bike. Ben had to wear that? And, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, he had – he wasn't that long, but he did. He, he wore these things. I mean, he just was going through all kinds of gross stuff. And his maturity, like, he wasn't mature. I mean, he was getting beat up in seventh grade. And, of course, you go from having all that success, right? I think he was an OAC state champ in sixth grade. And then seventh grade was just a really rough year for him. Um but you know, Ben, I mean, it was, you know, there was no giving up there. That dude was going to, he was going to hang top, which he did. You know, it's wild about him. He qualified for the state for you at 120 as a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> he was a state finalist the next year at 152. <laughs> yeah. And then a two-time champ at 82, I think. Is that right? 
Uh, yeah. Did he go 82 or did he go up to 95 his senior year? I want to say, oh, man, I wish I had Jack sitting next to me. Um, <laughs> Listen, all this would be uh, alleviated if the Jackalope were here. He lost his senior year, I remember, to Colin Moore. Yeah, that was I think so they were at 82. Uh, they were at 82. Yeah, at the D's. That, his junior year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was 82 that year, and I think he finished at 82. If I yeah, yeah because Colin was a year older than him. I think, yeah, right? that would have been yeah. that would have been more senior. Yeah, correct. But, so yeah, um, yeah, I mean, just absolute beast. But you know, the point they bought in style big time. You know, when he was younger, but he wasn't that good in freestyle. He just kept grinding. You know, and then he ends up being the outstanding wrestler in part. It's you know? wild. It's wild to think about the guys you've had. And they don't wrestle the inside tie barrel roll system. You got a guy like a Darmstadt, and you brought drills into it, you know, because I've been through your, in, with your camp system since like '99, right? And um, mm-hmm. cradle confidence is not something you would have been doing in 2002. I don't remember there being a cradle confidence in 003 when I was in college coming to camps. That's, yeah, I think Cradle Comp, yeah, that was a Joe Drago thing. That must have been around 04, 05. I think yeah, you, you get my yeah. point, though. It's like it's, a, it's the evolution of the sport, and you got to, you know, Jeff Jordan just doesn't do collar ties at his camp anymore. You're doing a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, right. You know, it, I mean, bre- collar ties was the, was the bread and butter, but they're doing underhooks. They're doing everything. Obviously, every two-on-ones, they're doing everything. So, and you have to do that. But, like, literally, the Burnett system's predicated off of tricep ties. Jordan system was predicated. The original systems are predicated off of uh, uh, collar ties. What was the Milkovich system predicated off? Inside tricep tie? Well, I want to say a lot of tie-ups because uh, I, I learned a really good snap down uh, from Pat Milkovich. Um, I, I learned um, a barrel roll, kind of a combination from Tom Milkovich and then uh, Coach Hada, Tadaki Hada. Um, it, it, a lot of just inside stuff, inside ties. You know, that's what I remember from the Milkovich system. Um, and I, I'm sure there was more, you know what I mean, as far as like back in Maple days and things like that. But I went through a lot of Tom Milkovich practices, um, a lot. And I, I had, I had good head position, you know, because of working with him, uh, good angles, things like that, you know. When did, to, was Tadaki a teacher at your school? I forget the, the whole Tadaki connection because you were yeah, he was, when Tadaki came around, right? Yeah, he was living in Ober. Um so we connected. I was very young. I mean, he, he would drive me. He would drive me. He was good friends. He's good friends with Bobby Douglas. So Coach Douglas would run um, a camp down at, you know, Malone College or something like that. And I would jump in with Coach Hada and we'd go, we'd go down there. And I think he probably, I think we went to the World Cup one time out in Toledo. I think we might have gone there. I could be wrong. We went to Vermilion. Vermilion hosted something where Coach was involved with that Coach Hata. So I, I just jumped in with him. You know, I was a little kid. Um, it's wild because we don't realize how wrestling rich our tradition here in North Northern Ohio is not just Northeast Ohio, right? Because the World Cup was in Toledo forever until the nineties, till the early nineties. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. It was in Savage Hall. And you could go watch all the best dudes in the world came to Toledo, Ohio every year. It was right. crazy. And I remember going watching. I tell you, I watched Schultz, Mark Schultz, Dave Schultz, and John Smith all lose in Savage Hall. And I went wow. up to John Smith afterwards, and he was signing kids' autographs. Him and his brother are, are MFing each other, screaming at each other. Because John lost. It was real weird because him and his brother are arguing. <laughs> And um, he's still signing our autographs and, like, being nice and personable. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's wild. It was wild. And then I had an Ohio State Buckeye hat. I've told him the story. He actually laughs at it. And I, uh, I, held, I gave him the hat. And I was like, can you sign my hat? And he's like, he signs my hat. And he's like, wrong OSU. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> wild though but yeah like having Tadaki you know around and what's wild about Tadaki is his family started the sport of wrestling this is the back to the a lot of the stuff is uh serendipity because there's no serendipity now right <laughs> you just go you just go take someone and you dial them up on your phone and then you can send them a dm and then you can go and be working with them right yeah 
this is serendipity how like z's your high school coach and then tadaki happens to live in oberlin like this is this is coincidence right it, it's wild and i mean you know coach Hada, he lives five blocks from me right now in Elyria. right i mean it's just it's crazy yeah i didn't realize he was that close to you yeah i mow his lawn man when he goes That's when right. he goes overseas yeah i go over and cut his grass and nate dog went over and i think uh did some raking for him and you know and, and coach you know he always he always takes care of us and you know obviously he's a fixture at our camps he's just he's the best you know he and mrs hotter they're the best yeah the guy's a legend remember hey remember the japanese film crew showed up with him <laughs> do you remember that the tv yeah. crew showed up at my- pie crafts and they had the, the the thing the big camera and they're like videoing him showing a bunch of Dudes on Lagrange technique. Yeah, that's right. That's why I forgot about that. Yeah, the Japanese film crew showed up with the Daki Hot at a Eric Burnett's wrestling camps in Lagrange, yeah. Ohio. <laughs> that is why. So think about it. Those people had four, uh, five days invested in that trip. Yeah, minimum five days invested in that trip of their life. That's wild. That's yeah, wild. right. How about the dude can still do his uh, age and push-ups? Oh man, I, yeah. I mean, he's yeah, he's just amazing. I, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> no the doubt first, he can be. They're the first family of Jap, Japanese wrestling. So I remember being in London with him. I, dude, there's a really cool picture that I got yeah, in with him in London because he let me sit with him in the seats. Taraki takes care of me as he does you, but the uh, the Japanese wrestlers will see him and they're like super respectful, and it's like. You don't think about it, but it's like when you see an iconic image uh, wrestler here, how people treat him, right? Like how people treat John Smith, right? How people treat. Well, I mean, it'd be like if you're, you know, if you're a basketball dude and you see like Naismith's son walking around. There you go. No, literally, (laughs) that that is that that is literally what it is. (laughs) Right. You went and so, oh, so you guys did the basket. And was it Kansas? Where was it? I forget. Right. Right. Isn't that the what it is? Basket. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Kansas or Indiana? I forget what it is. Right. It's a place where there's not a lot going on. <laughs> and that was how they invented it. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. That's from what I read. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. There I mean, a- we're, we don't know anything about basketball, but Tadaki's family, his dad came over in like 1928. And if it was a judo exchange tour, it was an and exchange. Yes, they saw amateur wrestling. I think it was in Oklahoma. If I, I could be wrong, and they're like, well, "What's that?" And then his next thing you know, they were actually within that four years of when his dad came over. I don't know if it was thirty-two or thirty-six. Which Olympics it was? It was one of them. They were in that Olympics. Japan was in that Olympics. If I'm not mistaken, they had a they had a gold medalist or a mel, a, a medalist right off the rip. It didn't take very long. No, it might have been a second cycle. Oh, yeah, like like in Berlin, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That Pretty is wild. unreal. Tadaki's dad did that. The hottest of the first family of wrestling, literally of Japan. The dad took it That's there. Wild. And it's 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 wild because you would think that other countries would have had it. Like we had it before Russia too, if you didn't know that. It's it's crazy. It's wow. just it's crazy. But um so you've had a wild you've had some really good mentors in your life, right? And I mean we're not even declaring yet. Think about that. This is just your youth in high school that we're talking about. We're talking about your dad, right? We're talking about your dad mm-hmm. and his system and just just everything, man. It's awesome. Um it, it's wild. It's wild to think about it. But um <clears throat> So your dad was a was a steel worker. Okay, here's the next thing. Your dad's from Elyria, Ohio. How did you guys end up in one of the most liberal college towns in the United States of America in Oberlin, Ohio? How did that happen? I, you know, I think I, I think there was a connection. My mom came over here from Germany when she was 14 years old. She came with her aunt and uncle, and they both, when they came over here, they got they got jobs at Oberlin College. And they lived on Park Street, and they, my mom walked to school. Park Street would would go right into the high school, so she lived like a block from a, a block and a half from the school. So 
obviously, I don't, she she grew or she spent her high school years in Oberlin. So did um, your mom graduate from Oberlin High School? Yeah, yeah. I didn't did. know that. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah, so so then yeah, they they hooked up and they got married. My dad came home from Vietnam. They got married. I think he actually went back to Vietnam after that and then came back again. But they lived in the apartments down the street from my house, like where I currently live on Hilliard Road. Oh, wow. So they were in Elyria. So, yeah, they, they, so when I was born, we lived in these apartments right down the street and um, right next to the fire firehouse. It was awesome. Like, you know, commute, imagine being like one, one and a half years old and the fire truck comes out and I used to lose my mind. Like, I'd be like, Dad, get me out there. You know, <laughs> my mom would come up and let me watch this fire truck race off to save lives, you know. Uh, but anyhow, so yeah, it was a great place. But then I don't know how they found out about this place on Professor Street out in Oberlin, but we ended up moving over there and, and that was uh, – you know, the rest is kind of history. You know, that's where that's where I grew up in Oberlin. You grew up literally like two at most two blocks, or is it a block or two off of the campus of Oberlin? Well, yeah, they're college houses. I would say two blocks down the street. Once you cross over, we used to be the railroad tracks, um, which is now uh, the bike trail. Yeah, then that is college property down there. You go back, walk on the on the trail. You go back into the arboretum where we went sledding on Devil's Hill, things like that. That is right on the cusp of uh, college property. Yes, yeah, so a couple of blocks. What's wild about it to me is, I, I when I talk about schools, did you know that they they trade with the Ivies for a cost? Did you know that? Uh, no, I did not. It's like eighty k. It's like eighty k to go to to seventy eight k whatever to go to Oberlin College. You didn't know that. I knew it was expensive. I Dude, didn't know oh, that. But. Other other little known fact: if you're they call you guys OBs, by the way, right? What what are the town? Oh wait, you're a townie. If you're a townie, you're a townie. If you're an Oberlin College student, you're an OB. Is that what it is? I don't know. We were townies. You were townies. You know I mean? The students were OBs, I believe. Does okay. that sound right? I don't know. They had some fun parties, which I didn't know anything about until I was in the college years. <laughs> ah. So okay, but here's the deal. If you could get in, if you were an Oberlin High School student and you could get into Oberlin, tuition's free. Well, actually, Kevin Vo was looking at that. Um, before, before he opened and rolled in Elyria, that had been the plan. Um, so that's a true thing. Had, I didn't just make that up. I didn't conjure that out of thin air. That's a real no, thing. No, that's what his mom and dad told me. He had um, never had a B. I had all A's through junior high. I'm pretty sure he didn't have a B in high school either. Um, but, yeah. So that was the one thing when he, you know, he wanted to come to Elyria because he felt like wrestling wise, our program could get him where he was trying to go. But yeah, there was, a, there was apprehension. Um, you know what I mean? On the, on the parents part, because they felt like he, he could go to college for free at, at Oberlin college. That's he stayed at Oberlin. wild. Mm -hmm. That is what, because I don't know of anybody else who like that. I mean, there's probably somebody else who has a precedent like that. But that's crazy. And then I think only like under 20% of the student body is from Ohio. So it's, not, it's a lot of out-of-state kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of kids from out of the country, too. I mean, you have the best, one of the best conservatories in the world, music conservatories. You know, um, I, I, our band director was amazing when I was in high school. I played in a concert band, and he did a lot with Dr. Knight. Dr. Knight was involved with the Oberlin College. He was actually my neighbor on Professor Street. So they hooked up a lot and we did a lot up at the college conservatory and you know people like my sister like uh, she got off on stuff like that you know me i just played a trumpet because i played a trumpet um <laughs> you know i mean i actually last i lost the trumpet off i told you about that my sister challenged me she was two years younger than me and she beat me and then it was like a, it was called, it was called a sectional it wasn't a trumpet off but you know what i mean like she beat me <laughs> She wanted my spot because I was third chair, first cornet. I was playing uh, the tough parts. I was pretty good. My so sister's like, bumped that. Was she an 88 or an 89 grad of high school? Uh, she was 89. She's two years younger than me, man. She she beat my ass in a trumpet off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And now she's the director of arts and perfor performing arts at uh, Hathaway Braun? 
Yeah, she's um, and she's got a whole bunch of, of initials after her name. I mean, she's she's very well educated. And just she just gets after it, man. She didn't have the same Dave Schultz problem as you did. No, <laughs> Dave Schultz would have been like Jenny Burnett. We're signing you up for Wisconsin. Yeah, right. Exactly. Welcome, welcome to the to the group. You're with us. You're, you're think, here. What was it with school, man? Why? What was your deal with school? It's lazy, dude. My sister sat in front of me. I had to take French twice. And the second time I took it, I was a senior. She was a sophomore. And I had like a sticky note. We had a quiz or something that day. And I tried to like very gently put this sticky note with the answers. Like I taped it to her shirt. She sat right in front of me. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do that. (laughs) So yeah, to uh, fail. yeah I, I was always trying to Jenny wasn't down with the cheating. No, she worked hard. You know, she's like, bump you, dude. Last night I was practicing my trumpet and doing my French, and you were in there rocking out the Led Zeppelin with your headphones on, not doing anything. Right and rap, I know what you write and rap lyrics. Right. No, I didn't write a lot of rap. I was a freestyler, man. I thought you had notebooks of raps. Well, that was yeah, that was uh that So was you did have school. you did, I'm not wrong. I, I would, yeah, but I would not, I would not use those. Those were just for me. I, I was a freestyler. You just wrote everything down, though? What was in the books that you had? What was, you just wrote stuff down? Yeah, there was a lot of random stuff, random thoughts, you know. I want you to think about how amazing it would be if we could find a box of those at Ron and Ruth's house right now if we went up in the attic and we could find a box of your notebooks i think i know exactly where they are um no, this dude you can't say stuff like that because now we're gonna have to see those yeah i i in, in 2017 after my dad passed away we went over um and i went up in the attic and i found a lot of stuff up there man it was a trip you know so all the, are the charts still out what happened to the charts what happened to all your four they're at the they're at the pie crafts barn they're still it's there. Soccer. Yeah, me, me Scotty's and mine. No way. Is the sign, the home of Eric Burnett sign still there? I think it is. And the basketball yeah. team? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, could you yeah, imagine they, the nostalgia of walking in there right now? What are, what are we removed from that place? 14 years? 15 years? Um, We stopped in in, um, oh, my goodness. It was me and Josh Breeding and Nico O'Dor. I think Nico might have been a senior in high school, but he was a sophomore. So let's see, breeding finished in what, seven, 18? So I think it was 2016. We just stopped in there. And they had a, they still had, now they've extended the apartment into the wrestling room. So it's not as big now. But yeah, but then it was still there. And I think um, Johnny was actually running some workouts out of there. Yeah, shoot. I mean, Nathan Tomasello was at Ohio State already. He was probably a sophomore, junior. We were camping at a campground out south of LaGrange. And Nathan came in and uh, worked out with us. Some of the kids that we had, we had gone camping together and we went in there. So we used the mats out there in like 2000, like, shoot, 2018, 2017. Nathan was still at Ohio State. So, so they still there. had mats down. Yeah, as far as I know, they might still have that. Mass wow, that that yeah, I haven't been in there. Mind. Yeah, man, we had a lot of well, there was a lot of lot, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears there. Obviously, for all the people that Logan Stever committed multiple felonies against his poor brother Hunter. Yeah, that was uh, they had, we had some we had some tough goes out there, dude. How about I ran into Bosselman the other day? Don't stop believing the king. Um, remember, <laughs> remember in the morning I had the, the iPod and we'd play the. We play the Don't Stop Believing, uh, the Steve Perry journey. Yes. That's how we ended all yes, this. Sir. Was awesome. Yeah. That was so much fun, man. I miss that. Um, here's what's wild about it, though. Like, it's all within, it's all right around Elyria and or Oberlin. So west side of Cleveland for people who are watching this, you know, right on the North Shore. What's crazy is, hey, there's the prison there. Do you remember when I was doing the summer classes at Kent State and I was staying? I was staying in 
I was working for you and just staying in LaGrange at the barn and there was a prison break. That's right. That's right. And it got real weird because they were chasing these dudes through the fields. Yeah. They went south. Yeah. They went south of the prison. They're on eight, it's 83. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the prison's on 83. There, well, there's a jail and a prison. And then, um, yeah, basically, mm -hmm. if they had gone straight west, a little bit northwest, and run through some fields and crossed over the Black River, they would have been right there on the uh, the old uh, the old apple orchard run that you used to have the kids do. Oh, the best with that the apple orchard run. Well, first off, why did we have to go to the apple orchard, Derek? I, I don't know. You liked it. Uh, okay. <laughs> We went to the apple orchard because there were definitely cars that were flying down the road and there were some close calls and we don't need close calls. Right. Oh, that was the, that, yeah, that was the Kenny thing. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. I, I, I wasn't going to bring any names to it, but we literally had a kid walk in traffic who was from um, either Cle was he from Cleveland or Illyria? No, he's one of my guys. He was amazing. He's an awesome kid. He just, <laughs> was, just ended up in the road and, the, and, and you was, know, but the, well, because it's different though. When you're out in the country, like where we're where I'm from, and then where the Pie Crash Barn is, Indian Hollow Road, people hum down that road, man. And we're talking, you know, it's a 55 speed limit. But people are doing 70, 80. Yeah, and we're you know the kids are running in the morning when people are driving to work and things like that. You know, it's you know, and it was never an issue. But yeah, the one dude, wow, that was a little a little nutty. Well, dude, it was right in front of the house, Eric, and I was yeah. screaming at him because the runs were my jam. That's like, hey, Zeb, plunging toilets, mopping mats, runs. Everything we don't want to do, you're going to do. So that, <laughs> that's what I did, right? People are like, well, do you show technique? And I'm like, yeah, not really. They don't need me to show any technique. We got really good technicians. I don't know why I would show technique. Well, what do you do? I'm like, eh, I map the mats. and I do the warm-up. I mop the mats. I make sure the sessions start on time. And I do the run. Oh, I plunge toilets too, right? They like asked me what my duties were, and they were like, "You show technique," and I'm like, "Yeah, no, I don't show technique. I think I only showed technique like a handful of times, maybe." Yeah, you I'm did. Awesome you though. showed some technique. Yeah, we wrestled. Yep. But anyhow, um, what's wild is we did the runs, and after the runs got suspended from the road, um, I started doing the apple orchard trees because they had rows they had about seven rows of trees maybe seven rows of trees well i started taking them there and it was dewy in the morning and i remember one time they like they kind of pissed me off and it was it was the julius steber ian tasari group right and i was like all right we're bear crawling and logan steber looked at me he's like you serious i was like as a heart attack we're bear crawling and they were just running. They were putting their hands on the ground and they were just pushing cause it was dewy and they didn't yeah. even have to really do that. And it was like, do you remember their shoes had the grass all over and we had to leave yeah. them outside and it rained on all their shoes. It was a good time. That might've been the, that might've been when they, the, the, the dude uh, in Austin town brought the camper, brought the trailer off out there. And they would, they, they those guys slept on the trailer the one night and, one of them drank a bunch of Mountain Dew and ate a bunch of pizza and vomited all over the place. And was like, I didn't eat the pizza, drink the Mountain Dew. And yeah, and that, I think, I think you might've had them doing some extra for that. I think, if I recall. I'm thinking that. it was that Jamie Clark or Cam Tassari, which one? It might've been Cam, but it, to this day, to this day, that dude will say it wasn't me. <laughs> so I'm not sure it was him, man, because we pressed him hard, but he, I saw he him said this it weekend. wasn't him. Hey, I saw him this weekend on crutches. Oh, really? Cam, yeah. He, he had, like, the, the Kaczynski thing going. The Ted Kaczynski thing going. He's got, like, long hair and a beard. And he was on – he was on – you must have yeah. done surgery. So, well, I just know he's doing great. Yeah. I know that he is really, really where he needs to be, doing an awesome job. Hey, who doesn't love a good redemption story? Who doesn't love a good redemption story? Right, right? on. I love it. Cam hey. is the guy. I like him. Hey, was there a more yep. go for broke guy? Did you, ever, did you ever have a more go for broke guy than that guy? Yeah, he just was really fun. I mean, you know, and I didn't, I didn't coach him in high school, but we got to do a lot of freestyle and things like that. He just was fun, man. You know, just go for it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, double overhooks. Let's go. Right? Yeah. He, he yeah. didn't care. Hey, fourth as a true freshman in, in, in D1. How about that? Yeah, what do you win? Like six or seven in a row? He lost, he first, lost round. first round. He lost first yeah. round. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my God. What a nutbag. I love it. Good dude, though. I like Cam. Um, so, okay. Ron got you guys into Oberlin, and you went to Oberlin High School. This was kind of right as people started to move and do stuff, right? Like, that started to become big in the 80s, didn't it, when people would transfer and go to schools? Uh, a little bit. It wasn't like it is now, but, yeah. I mean, there were a few guys moving around. Yeah. But you stayed in Oberlin, and you had the big zero on your chest. Mm-hmm. The block O, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. I had some amazing people, though, that helped me. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I had good training partners. You know, especially as a 98-pounder, you know, at Oberlin, I, there were guys there that could work with me. So, my friend Chris and just, you know, some guys. We had guys. You know, Dave Sonner. Um, we had guys there. You know, but as I got older – you know, I was always welcome in the Elyria room or in the Southview room or the North Olmstead room. I was welcome. You know what I mean? And I got to go and train with a whole bunch of people, you know, which is kind of why we're like we are, right? Because everybody helped me regardless of what school I went to. So, you know, it's what you do. So uh, I guess we're at the point where I'm going to ask you, how did you meet my brother Ferd? Because that's how that's the whole relationship that we have with you guys, and how I came to start working with you and doing all this stuff. But where did what? How old was Ferd, and where did you guys meet? Milkovich wrestling camp. Ferd was like a fat kid. I think it was our freshman year. I might have been eighth grade going into ninth grade or ninth grade. Yeah, don't tell Ferd I said that because he's not a fat kid anymore. But he, okay. uh, I will tell. Yeah, yeah. He, um, yeah. I mean, dude, we 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 hit it off. I mean, it was like, we just, we had the best time. Obviously everybody worked hard, right? I mean, you know, Bird ends up becoming a state champion, you know, um, because of his work ethic. So we worked really, really hard, but we had a whole lot of fun, like down in the game room and in the cafeteria. And it just, we just, we hit it off. And then I ended up coming to your house all the time, and, you know, hanging out with you guys. And I don't know. It was amazing. Just amazing. So you guys met there as freshmen because you and Ferd are both 87 grads of high school, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to say freshman. I mean, what's eighth grade going into ninth, maybe? I don't know. Right around there. He talks about that you were the star pupil. You were like the guy for them, he said. He's like, oh, yeah, they'd have Eric, and then Eric would show a lot of the technique, and they'd have Eric doing everything, and Eric was in there. You were like the star pupil, right? That, that's what he I, says, at least. I, well, I, I, I started going there when I was very young. You know, I think I went to Ohio State when I was seven, uh, seven or eight. And, and then I think the next year I was at Milkovich. He was right there in Berea at Baldwin Wallace. And uh, Milkovich, just, they really took care of us. I would go multiple weeks. Um, so, I, so I knew a lot of what they were teaching, you know what I mean, and, and how their system was. Um, so, yeah, by the time I'm, I'm getting into high school, you know, there were some things that they would be like, all right, you know, I, I mean, they'd be teaching, but they would say, you know, Bernard, get up here and do this. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. He said that Pat and Tom Milkovich were in their 40s. He said these dudes could absolutely bang, <laughs> like drilled. He said they would drill high pace for like an hour. He said it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were bad dudes, man. Absolutely, they're freaks. Like those guys are genetic freaks on top of being bad dudes. Is that is that somebody told me they went uh, fishing with them in Florida? With uh, Craig Castler, or somebody told the story, and uh, my brother Chad, somebody, and they said Tom Milkovich was underwater for like three minutes. Like wow. he held his breath and was swimming around. And he spear fishing or something for like three minutes. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's nuts. <laughs> Dude, he said it, Dude, I was, it might have been Ferd. He said the guy was underwater for like three minutes. Yeah, that, that's special. I mean, I, I fell out of a white, I went whitewater rafting and fell under the boat. I was there for – I looked at the video. I thought I was underwater for two minutes, three minutes. I was like th- – my thoughts of my family were going through my head. I, I came up. 
got back in the boat. First thing I did when I got my truck, when we were leaving to come home was I called my wife, told her how much I loved her. I was like, I, I, dr I almost drowned. I came back to life, whatever. And then I get home and they had a dude following us around. So the whole thing was on video. It was on a disc. <laughs> so I'm like, me and Toby, one of our other coaches, we both had fallen out of our raft. And, you know, you got the little orange helmet on, right? Yeah. So I'm watching the video with my wife, with Janet, and Toby was here, too. We were watching it. And I'm like, all right, here's where we dump. I'm like, watch. Watch how long it was. Well, it's like three seconds later, one of the orange, one of the helmets comes off. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be Toby. That's got to be Toby. And like a second later, I pop up. So, dude, I was underwater for four seconds. And my, like I said, I thought I was dead. So, yeah, I can't imagine this dude swimming around trying to spear a fish for three minutes, you know, underwater. Did you ever, did you ever, ever sent you the video of what happened to me in uh, Christmas Eve 2014 in Washington, Washington State? I don't know. I don't know if you sent it. What, dude, what happened? My best friend is a filthy, stinking liar. John, I think you've met him before, a big tall guy. The, uh, his dad was Claude. You probably remember his dad was Claude. He had the coon hunting dogs. It was in okay. between us and Kyle. He lived in between us and Kyle on this road. Um, well, John like moved out west, and that's why I'm in Portland all the time because John lives out there. Um, okay. So 2014, I was going from the Reno TOC to Hawaii, and I had like this like six day window where I was in between, right? So I just went to Portland and stayed with him, right? And it was right before I had a family wasn't married yet so went out and um he's a tremendous liar right like a really bad liar and he's an adrenaline junkie okay so we went and um we were going to the uh east fork of the lewis and like battleground or cougar washington and i believe the thaw comes from mount st helens i believe like the the, the thaw that you're riding the water you're riding the swell is from Mount St. Helens, you know? So those That's when you were are... sending me the pic, the pics of Mount St. Helens, I think, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're going, it's December, it's December 24th, it's Christmas Eve. We go and we leave Portland and it's like, I want to say like an hour, hour and 15, maybe an hour and a half. I, I don't know, whatever. But we're, we're driving up and we're separate because you got to drive one vehicle down here where you're going to, where you're going to end up. And then you, then you, you drive up and you, float back down does that make sense yep and you're losing a ton of elevation and the rivers are just crazy right we get there and he's like ah it's gonna be a great day we're gonna stick this we're doing this and that and the dude he starts when we drop the one vehicle off he starts crushing beers and i'm like <laughs> what's going on here and he's and he's like, ah yeah and then we go and we scout this thing called sunset falls and i'm like Here's what you got to understand, Eric. I, I don't belong on Sunset Falls. Kind of like John doesn't belong at a college wrestling practice, right? So this dude must have thought I slept on a book about whitewater rafting and then <laughs> went with him. Osmosis, right? Yeah, sure. And I, and we got there, and I remember it's like as he's progressively drinking beers and he's like pumping the raft up and he's just gassing me up. He's like, yeah, this was gonna happen. The nar nar, and we're gonna get in it, and it splits, and you gotta go here. Go here, you're gonna have a bad day. You gotta go here, and I'm like, <laughs> he's talking about the gnarly. They're calling it the nar nar, and then you know, get to the eddy, and I'm like, eddy's like the little area that's like a side area where like you can paddle off. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, yeah. Talking about if there's furniture in the water, and I'm like, what's for what furniture? That that's wood, by the way. There's wood or debris, furniture in the water. Nar nar furniture. Get to the eddy. There's a cave here. Uh, sieve. You know, he's saying all these words, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So as as he's crushing more beers and get we're getting closer, like he drops in. He's like, ah, you got to get wet first, and we're in wetsuits because the water's 34 degrees. And I'm like, all right, so we get wet and we, and, and you go from a class three into a class four. It's a 20 foot waterfall. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you guys do any like surfing? You know what I'm talking about? No. I'm talking about an eddy. No. Like, that's how we dumped. We were trying to surf on this little no. hole. Yeah, okay. No. All right. So we go to this 
and it turns about out and it's like progressively things get it turns into if we've got to swim or if if it happens that we have to swim or if we swim to hey we might have to swim to we get up to it and he's like hey we're probably gonna have to swim make sure you get to that cave or that and that eddy if you don't it's gonna kill you and i'm like and you're in i'm in it at this point I'm yeah, in right. it. so we do the three and you drop right down into a class four somebody called it a five though i don't think it's a five i think like some people if, if like you want to make people feel better you call it a five it's not a five though i think it's a four it's a legit four though so we run this and the raft just flips over and we hit it and I hit the water and I reach up and I grab the rope around the raft and he's like, oh man, he's just got a, he's a lunatic. He's like, whatever you do, you do not lose my paddle. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I'm holding on to the paddle with one hand and I'm holding on to the boat with another hand. Well, I started a camera. So our camera has been filming for 45 minutes of him pumping up the boat, crushing more beers and gassing me up that we're going to stick this landing. Right. And he deflates me within like a, a minute and 20 seconds from getting down to the rapid of, Hey, we're probably going to have to swim. And I'm like, wait a minute, you were saying we're going to stick it. So we, we swim. How long do you think it, it caught me? The waterfalls recirculating current caught me. And yeah. Pulled me in like a conveyor belt and I was holding onto the boat and he got out around to the front of the boat. And he's trying to like frog kick. Yeah. He's like, man, the boat was stuck on something. I couldn't get it out. The boat was stuck on me, is what it was stuck on. Oh, Dude, wow. I, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. When I send you, send you, I was under for 54 seconds. Oh, that sucks. Though. I was drinking water. I'm like, oh, and I remember being like, oh, and I remember my life flashing before my eyes. And I was like, yeah, wow. Uh, and the best is I showed the video to my dad. And he's like, why didn't that person film and help you, boy? And I'm like, dad, because it's on a tripod just running. It was me and this drunk idiot running it. And he was like, that's on you, boy. And I'm like, dad, what? You, yeah, I know. It's funny because my dad and Claude still kick it. They still hang out and do like, just like hang out and talk. And they're both like retired and live next to each other. And it's just like. Claude knows John's a lunatic, though. Dude, he's run like a 70-foot yeah. He ran a 70-foot waterfall. I'm going to send you some stuff. You're going to get anxiety watching it. Yeah, dude. I don't know. Oh, man. It makes me sick. <laughs> like, some of the stuff this dude's done, I'm like, this guy's a whack job, nut, nut job. And he just moved out of Portland to the base of Mount Hood. It's called Sandy, Oregon. And, um, you know, like, uh, where they filmed The Shining, that, like, building okay. where The Shining. He yeah, lives right sure. by that. He lives about 45 minutes from that. Wow. Timberline Lodge. He lives about 40, 45 minutes from that. Might be a little longer. Depends on the weather. Um, and he's got a river in his backyard. And he's like, hey, you're going to come out and run it? I go, dude, I'm trying to stay alive and married. What, why, why yeah, no, I'm good. I'm yeah, like, I'm you're a now. liar. You're a liar. <laughs> I was under 52 seconds, dude. 52 yeah, seconds. Yeah. And this, this cat just thought nothing of it. The, the best part of it, when I send you this YouTube video, it's called John and Zeb Sunset Disaster. It's the name of the video. <laughs> John and Zeb Sunset Disaster. John, and, there's John, uh, hold on, hon. John, John and Zeb Sunset Disaster. You can't watch it on your phone right now. You know what? I think I can share the screen right now. We're going to watch it. I want to just show you this. Let's give this some context here. You ready? Let's see. I, I think I can share the screen. Let's see. Let's see how my skills are here. You ready? I, I think it's worth watching. So let's hear it. Let's go. Here we go. Ready? Let's see it. Uh, it's worth it. You're just going to be like, yeah, you're a stupid idiot. You deserve that. Oh, then another time he got me to, uh, we ran this other class four on the White Salmon River. And he uh, he convinced me. I remember we tacoed the boat in half and then my face was numb for like an hour and he convinced me to drag the boat back up the mountain and we did it again and we stuck it actually. Oh geez. Yeah. No dice. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good with the good old, good old fashioned fail. Were you guys in West Virginia? Where were you, Eric? We were on the new river. Yeah. You, in West, yeah, Virginia. In West Virginia, right? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. 
this this stuff here. Let me see. I gotta hack the screen real quick. Yeah, my dad was like, uh, why is that person helping you? I'm like, Dad, because there wasn't a person to help us. Yeah. Hold on, yeah, let me yeah. see if I can share. Let I don't remember this, but I'm gonna try and figure it out. You ready? Share screen. Here you go. You ready? Here you go. We're gonna do it. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. All right, you ready? Here we go. He's in the fluorescent. I'm the other one. Okay. Blimp. Oh, geez. So, yeah, here's where the boat is stuck on you. Yes, right? <laughs> so I got my paddle. Do you see what it's doing, though? It's yes. sucking me under, dude. Yeah. You yeah, can't breathe in there. You can't breathe right now. No, you can't breathe underwater. So, look, he throws his paddle in. Watch. Not unless he already did it. Did he already do it? There it is. His paddle just yeah. went in. And he's around the front, and he's pulling. He's like, I can't. I couldn't. The boat was stuck on something. The boat was stuck on something. See him? See him yanking on it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm underwater drinking water right now. Do you understand I'm still underwater? Oh, yeah. You're under the back of the boat. Yep. It just released me right now, and I just got my first breath. There you go, buddy. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's just anxiety, bro. Oh, I knew. I knew you would love that, Eric Burnett. Uh, I knew you would love it. You were under four seconds. I was just under for like 52. Yeah, no. Four I can't believe you've never funny. seen that. No, I don't think I have. Oh, it makes me sick to think. And I, I had the, I don't know if you know about like what happens to people when they drink a lot, like not hydrate, drink a lot of water, but if you're in a near drowning situation, people can drown later on that night because they have so much water in their lungs. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. How wild is that? Yeah, that's nuts, right? I'm all right. Things are cool. Yeah. Go to bed. That's it. It's a wrap. Yep. Hey, hey. later. All right, I love it how the sidebars are, are pretty epic here. I think we're gonna we're probably not gonna be under uh, the, the barbarian hour has sailed. By the way, we're in, we're in a, <laughs> we're in overtime here. If you didn't know that, you okay with that? All good. You okay with that? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. All good. Okay, so Ron Burnett, your dad, huge obviously with your wrestling career, he puts you on some pretty good people. I mean, we just, I think we've just done a who's who of Ohio wrestling people with the Milkoviches, Tadaki, the z -mans. Well, my Uncle Glenn, my Uncle, my Uncle Glenn wrestled at Elyria. He's, he's oh, okay. three years younger than my dad. And so Uncle that's Glenn. how, when I came home in first grade with this paper, you know, Oberlin Bitty Wrestling, uh, my dad was like, yeah, this is your, this is, you know, and then he told me about my uncle and. You know, we made we made a few road trips together. I man, I always got my ass kicked. I mean, I got I got beat up at Oakland Bitty Wrestling, and then we'd go places, and I'd get a participation ribbon and get my ass kicked there. And um, but yeah, I mean, it was just something we did, and my my uncle was involved, and you know, we just we just it was a lot of fun, you know. And he was like four year, four or five years younger than your dad. Yeah, I want to say they weren't in high school together. So he would. I'm thinking he was in eighth grade when my dad was a senior or something like that. I think. And Uncle Glenn was the super fit uncle, right? Like he, similar yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah, more so than me. Yeah, definitely. Um, he did marathons and stuff, didn't he? He did a lot of biking. He played a lot of handball, handball, racquetball. He could play, he could play racquetball with both hands. I mean, at, at very high levels. Um, and he, later on, he was, doing, he was playing pickleball. You know, once his once his shoulder started to, to give out. Um, you know, he didn't play as much. He was still doing training. He was training people, um, you know, right, right up until he passed away. I mean, he, he, you know, he was just, he was amazing. I'd see him walking around the area fast, like walking, like for a workout. Um, yeah, just amazing. Amazing. But yeah, he was a guy that comes out for wrestling is basically at the end of his junior year. And I think by his senior year, he was like a match from going to state, you know, just, just, just amazing athlete. And he, he recently passed away, right? Yeah. Uncle Glenn did, right? Yes. What did he do for a living? Um, he worked at 
he was retired. He worked at GM, I believe. Okay. Uh, but he, he had been retired from there for a while. And, um, yeah, he's li living, living his best life. Amazing. Your mom's a German immigrant, right? Yep. So can you hear your mom's accent? Oh, yeah. You can. Okay. okay. Yeah, like Martin Floriani could not hear his dad. His dad passed away like 10 years ago. And, I, and he's like, yeah, kids used to come over and would be like, why does your dad talk funny? And he's like, what are you talking about? He's so, yeah, hear. when I was a kid, oh, yeah, when I was a kid, sure. You know, people would say, what, what's up? You know what I mean? Um, but, I mean, yeah, man, my, my – so, yeah, my great aunt, we always called her grandma, right? So she would come over and we'd go over to her house on Park Street. And Wait, did you call her grandma or Oma? No, we called – we actually called her grandma. Oma okay. lived in Germany. Okay. So when Oma and Opal would come over here, they were Oma and Opal, um, my, my mom's parents. But um, Sprechen Sie so, yeah. Deutsch, got it. Well, they would go all nutty. Like, they'd be sitting there talking in German about stuff I'm assuming they didn't want us to know about, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, come over, you know, yeah, your mom talks different, whatever. But, yeah, you know, so, but, but even, but now, of course, you know, now I don't live with her. I see her a lot, but. So I, I hear it a lot. You know, I hear the accent a lot. Yeah, because if you're, you're saturated with it, you wouldn't know. Like, Floriani didn't understand that his dad was talking like this. And he didn't, like, you didn't. Because yeah. if you hear someone who speaks, um, an Italian native speaker comes here, they, they speak in, like, rhythm. I don't know if you have ever, have you ever mm -hmm. noticed. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't know yeah. what, yeah, he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what he told me. I was like, all right. Makes sense, yeah, I guess, because yeah. if you're saturated with it, you wouldn't know. But, um. So, okay, you go from Elyria or you go from Oberlin High School, right? You had a big zero in your chest, which was, you said yep. was your GPA. How do you end up, what did it come down to for colleges for Eric Burnett, Ohio's fourth, fourth, um, four time state champion? What, like, what did it come down to for colleges for you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of other schools at that point that had contacted me were learning about, you know, we're, we're finding out more about my, my academic situation. And it wasn't that, you know, Wisconsin was very honest and abrupt and they're like, Hey, good luck. We're not going to recruit you. The other schools just basically weren't calling you. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Um, yeah. Ohio state was still, was still interested. And then Clarion, I, um, I went up, coach Davis continued to call me. Um, I went up there on a visit. And uh, I was locked in. Like, I just, I loved it. And I actually gave them, um, I gave them a verbal um, that day. I believe it was in, in April. And um, that was it. You know, I, I just knew where I was going. You know, and I, I came home and I called Coach Ellickson. And, you know, I just told him that I, I felt like, you know, my thing, my thing, uh, the one thing I was really smart about is I, I knew that even though, Ohio State, all those guys down there were amazing, right? Like, you know, DeSabados and Marinelli and Kenny Ramsey. And, but, and, I, and I knew I would be around a bunch of good people, but, but I, I, I just felt like the size of the campus was going to really, you know, I, I was kind of, I was a little bit, yeah, I was a little bit loose, you know, so I, I felt like, I felt like that, that, could, that could hurt me um, because of who I was. I mean, I was a 17 year old kid. I, I actually left for college. I'm still 17 years old, you know. Um, so I just, I, I, I just, I recognize that my maturity probably wasn't where it needed to be at that point. So you get the Clarion and you cannot, you are not on the team to start. Is that correct? Right. But here's the thing, and you know, back then there were no volunteer coaches. There were no RTCs, things like that. So I wasn't allowed to be a part of any team activities. Um, but like the, the coaching staff, like they, they watched out for me, like anything that was within the rules, you, you know what I mean? Like people knew what was going on with me. Like if I was somewhere I should be, I mean, it was like six hours later, somebody knew about it, you know? And this is before um, cell phones too. Oh yeah, dude. I mean, yeah, there was nobody running around with a camera phone. Like I and being like, Oh, there's Bernie over there. He's right behind the barbershop and he's doing something weird. It was none of that. You know what I mean? It was just, but, you know, I mean, Coach Bob would call my dorm room and he'd be like, hey, hey, Bernie, hey, Bernie, uh, where were you this morning at 830? I'd be like, I was in class. He's like, no, you weren't, Bernie. 
You know what I mean? I'm like, well, come on, man. It's 10 o'clock. You know I mean, the class went from like eight to nine. It's 10 o'clock. The dude's calling me. Like, he knows I wasn't in class. I mean, you know? So yeah, I mean, but that, you know, of course it pissed you off. You know what I mean? When you're, you know, freshman in college, but you know, part of me, even, like I said, even being dumb, even being the, the dumb ass I was then understood that this was a good thing, you know? Um, and it, it was like, it was like that the whole time. Uh, they always knew what I was doing. They just had their thumb on you. And think about how hard that is because you got 20, 30 other guys on the roster and you're, you're putting yeah. a lot into this guy. And the thing about it is they had the guy, they had the modern day version. They had the 1989, 86, 87, 88, 90, 91 version of Gable Stevenson on the team. Right. They had a guy, they had this, they had Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle, is he the same class as you, Eric? Yeah, we came in at the same time. So they got this guy, right? They got this guy who's a future Olympic champion and WWE superstar. And, you know, Kurt Angle, you're the same class. Think about that. How easy it could have been for them to be like, yeah, this dude's a, this guy's a joke. This guy's a joke. Well, yeah, that's what I feel, I feel really good about that because what they were doing was they were providing opportunities for him. I don't think they necessarily had to worry about Kurt the way they had to worry about me, right? So they could just – they could provide opportunities for him that, that he was ready for. And, and, and meanwhile, you know, me, they had to babysit. It was, it was just – it was apples and oranges. My point but is they, like – my point is like they could have just phoned it in on you. I mean like, well, we got this oh, no doubt. low no maintenance. Doubt. Like why, why even – let's just do it with the guy who – this guy who does everything right. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's – right. That's easy for a lot of people to do. They give up on kids. Yeah, well, I mean, they were absolutely invested in me. I mean, from day one. You know what I mean? And, and I know. I know I drove the great. There were times when I, I, I know, you know. And the fact that they stuck with me and, you know, just, just, gave, me, just gave me chances. You know, it was great. And that's the thing. You know, Kurt was at that level where he was getting opportunities, right? I was getting chances, right? I, and, and, then, and then, of course, Later on, it turned into opportunities, if that makes sense. You know, once, yeah, no, once, once you're ready, for, you know, and uh, just, I mean, just talk about study tables and things like that. I mean, you, you, I could not blow off a study table. If, if, I mean, if I did, there would be somebody calling my dorm room by the time, like if I walked past, we had our study table in the top part of the gym, one of the classrooms. So if I walked past Tip and Gym to go to Campbell Hall, where I live, by the time I would get to my dorm room, my phone would be ringing. You know what I mean? Like. Why aren't you here? And, you know, I mean, it just, that's just the way it was. My, my senior year, I was one of the captains. Um, so, so I had grown up enough to where they, they weren't worried about me in that regard. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, even, even my junior year, I was starting to get, you know, but yeah, there were, there were a couple of rough years, man, where um, if it hadn't been for, for them being tenacious and staying on me, I'm not sure what the heck would have happened, man. You know what I mean? Is that do you you know, think all a, a big part of you, though? Do you think it's a big part of why you don't give up on kids? Well, there's no doubt. You know, and things were different back then, man. You know what I mean? They, they, now, now, man, it's like these guys are the, – the way, the way the system is, and, and, you know, if a guy doesn't graduate, that's a ding against the coach or the program. Or if a guy transfers, that's a ding. You know, back, back then, I just feel like it was – I feel like it was more fair. I feel like they could – they can really invest in somebody and say, Hey, we're, we're going to give you another chance. You know, I, I was smart enough not to make the same mistake twice. I made a lot of mistakes, but it wasn't like the same stuff over and over again, you know? Um, so yeah, no, I, in those, in those guys. And then of course that enabled me to learn from them. Right. And you know how you do, right. So you're always borrowing. You know, as you, no matter what you want to do, right? You're going to borrow from somebody, even if you're a businessman, if you're, whatever. You're borrowing from a coach or a mentor or a professor or a teacher or a family member, whoever. You know, you're always borrowing. Well, I had so many people, you know, to, to borrow from. And it started, of course, at a young age. And then when I realized I was going to coach, you know, I'm, I'm working these clarion wrestling camps. And, and you remember, I, I don't know if you ever went to a clarion wrestling camp, but these camps would be anywhere from 250 to 300 some kids. But they had it broken down to a science, right? They had separate gyms. So, so each group of kids was no more than maybe 25 to 30 kids, right? And even the main gym, the main gym had different like sectors, different mats, right? So your gym was like mat, whatever, right? So 
And then he had the North gym, the South gym, the wrestling room. And the clinicians were a bunch of like badass high school coaches, like dudes who knew how to teach wrestling. Right. And I may not have known some of the names. They might not have been the NCAA champions. Some of them were, you know, Gary Barton, guys like that. But some of the guys were like good college wrestlers, but were legendary coaches. And I would watch the way they would teach and how they would relate to the kids. Right. And just, I learned so much from those guys that like by my second year, there were some Ohio teams that were coming in that knew me, right. Because of my high school background and I was learning how to teach and we were doing little side clinics, you know, whether it was Olmstead Falls or Galleon Northmore or, you know, so I would have opportunities to, to, to run these little mini clinics, you know? So I knew, I knew that I was going to coach. So, so why wouldn't I be like picking the brain of one of the best college coaches in history, right? I mean, dude, that's where Charlie Fifniak came from, man. And, 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 you know, and, and Skilly Skill Pots. And, you know, that was, those are all Bubba. That was, that was all Coach Bub, you know, as far as like, you know, we're getting ready to go to the, you know, EWL tournament. He's like, yeah, if you're watching Skilly Skill Pots, you're not going to, you're not going to beat, you know, you see how skilly skill pots in the quarters, but you're not, you're worried about him, but you're not worried about your first round guy. You know what I mean? And it was just, and the, and the way coach Bob would, would deal with you. It was just, it was, it was, I want to say strict, but fair, right? Yeah. It was, it was fair. Uh, even, even when you're cold busted and pissed off about getting busted, you always knew that he was fair, you know? And, and the whole staff was like that, man. It was, um, I don't know, you know, Nellis, Nellis was on our staff, Coach Davis, uh, you know, Bob Sire, Mike Cole. Mike Cole was a graduate assistant, you know. And, you know, Mike, once again, was very fair. Mike was still young, still could get at it, and would just beat you up if you missed a morning workout. Like, if you stayed out late, you know what I mean, and you, you were out too late and you didn't show up in the morning workout, he's, hey, hey, Bernie, come on, let's go. You go with me for a little while. You know what I mean? It's like. He pound um, you. He just put it on you. Well, and it, it was always, yes, and it was always needed. And, yeah. and you know, that, that, you know, when you talk about having a second, uh, a second, I don't want to say childhood, but a second set of formative years, that makes sense? Yeah. Right? So you have your formative years growing up. And then when your maturity level is still fairly low, and then you have that second set of formative years with like a different family. So, of course, my family at home, was still raising me, right? They, they, you know, they're still my parents, even though I'm 19, 20 years old. But I had a second family in Clarion that I'm not sure I would have had anyway. I mean, no knock in any other program, but I know what I had there, you know. What was your career like? You know, like what 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 were the uh you know qualifications? Did you qualify? Obviously you missed the for the red shirt year, what should have been quote unquote the red shirt year for you was a was called a prop year. And you weren't on the team. Yeah. You weren't in the team activities, but they could did, 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 did as much as they could to offer support. They get you through the first year. What happens? Were you going to opens and stuff that first year? Were you doing? What were you doing? Yeah, I mean, it was hard to train. I was training at Clarion High School. They had a pretty good, like, 152-pounder back then that I would – I'd have to walk. Like, I'd walk from Campbell Hall. Their high school was over by the football stadium, so I had to walk all the way through town. Um, don't get me wrong. It's not like walking across New York City, but it was like – it was far enough to where I remember it would be, I could listen to about half of 2112. Okay. From Campbell hall to, to the high school um, <laughs> rush 2112. Um, so yeah. I get there, I would wrestle and then I would walk back to the dorm and I would try to get in the weight room. I, I couldn't do anything with the team. Right. And these guys were all my buddies. So I ended up like, I think I went to the, I went to the WB open that year. I didn't place. Um, actually lost to Prescott there. Um, that 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 year you then, guys the same then year? we went the to, same graduating year yeah yeah 87 grad yeah. High School. okay and he really took off like that year he was okay but he really took off like the next year is when gotcha. he, he got really 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 good um but he, he was don't get me wrong he was really good that year too but he he really took off so yeah i think i think there i think um you know i might have went no no yeah, I think I only went to like WVU, and then I went to like a freestyle tournament. Um, 
you know, in, in the spring. But no, it, it was it was it was hard because you couldn't train, you know, and, and not not the way you wanted to. Um, so then that summer, I think I took summer classes. It seemed like I was constantly on double secret probation. Like it was like, you know, I, like, I, I had to do it a little bit better. So I was in summer classes and whatnot. But you, you were know, always the, on your last, like, you're always on your last leg. It sounds like. Yeah, man. It was, you know, because I was a bonehead. Like you just, you know, it, it, uh, you know, for, for a little while, for a while anyhow. Yeah. Um, but, but, but there was always somebody there like, come on, man, you, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but it was always the message. You're better. Than this. You're better. Than this. You know what I mean? You can, you can do better. Um, so yeah, but the, the, the key, I feel like one of the keys to my wrestling life, maybe even life is, is the camps, those camps that we had in Clarion, man, because it was, it was an extension. Like, and I was always pushing the envelope. Like you needed to be there at eight o'clock in the morning and coach Bub would be in the store. Like you had to walk, through the lobby to basically get to any of the gyms, whether it was North gym, South gym, main gym, wherever. And coach Bub would be in the store, like selling shirts and stuff like that. So there were times where, you know, it'd be like five minutes after eight and you're doing like the cartoon stuff. And like, you're like sneaking to the hole because Bub and you don't see, right? Like you're trying to hide behind the, the pillar and then you got to go up the steps and he would oh, invariably he would see you and he'd be like, Bernie, if you're not five minutes, what was it? If you're not five minutes early, you're five minutes late. You know what I mean? And I'm yeah. like, I was chronically, you know, just not super late, but enough to where, you know, I mean, to this day, when I go into a school building, I take my hat off because Coach Bob, when you walked into the building, you took your hat. Off. You, know, you didn't walk around in a building with a hat on. Um, these are really cool like life lessons, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and you know, um, it's it just, you know, it's things that, you know, I, like I said, I, I just got to, I got to watch coach Bob and, and, you know, these other coaches and like how they presented themselves, how they lived and how they took care of the people that were in their, in their program. You know what I mean? And like I said, being the guy that was always pushing the envelope and not getting kicked out on my ass is pretty, pretty amazing that, that what, what, what from what they did for me you know so they get you through that first year that prop year that that the prop 48 year like a year you're knowledgeable and they get you on the team are you in the starting lineup right away as a redshirt freshman as a second year are you in the lineup right away no we had a really good guy man we had, we had a guy named Corey jones and um we had a wrestle off uh, that year that went zero zero two matches in a row and he beat me. He had a few more seconds of riding time and that's how it was decided basically. So he was starting. I went to the Midlands with Mike Cole. Mike was a red shirt that year. Mike, Mike red shirted. And we drove, he had this car that you, the speedometer didn't work. You had to go by the RPMs. <laughs> so he was so on the way to Midlands. I think it was me, him, and I think maybe his buddy Pat might have went from Boston University. Pat, I, I can't remember. So we, we drive there, and Mike drove the whole way there, or those guys did, anyhow. So then we get done. I got hurt. I got beat, and then I got hurt. So I, I tore my intercostal muscles. Okay. So we're driving back, and Mike gets tired, and he's like, "All right, Bernie, you, you, you're driving." And I'm like, dude, that, your, your speedometer doesn't work. And he's like, well, when the RPMs get up to like three, that's when you're doing like 60, right? So I was a mess. Like I, I was driving this car. It, it sucked. I drove like two hours. Through. I don't know, man. But I, And I got hurt. So I came back. I wanted another shot at a wrestle off, but I couldn't do it. I mean, I don't know if you know, your intercostal muscles just suck because you just have to take time what off. What is it? And what is Top. it? It's the muscles like underneath your rib cage. Like there's oh, cartilage in there yeah. and there's muscles You're in there. Yeah. So I would take like three or four days and then I would jump back in the room. I would grab a guy and I'd say, because they didn't want me in the practice room because I was supposed to be sitting out. So I would grab somebody and try to wrestle. And then I'd be like four days delayed again. Like, oh, I did it again. You know what I mean? Yeah. So me, 
I went to the doctor and it was right around, I went over to the infirmary and I went to her, to the doctor and um, he had me do, and it was right before the deadline. You had to decide if you're going to, if they're going to redshirt you. And I was, I, I didn't fake it. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I was, I wanted to try to fake my way through it and be like, I'm ready. I'm ready. But I couldn't, like I was so banged up. And um, so the doctor ended up kind of reporting to, the coach is how I was as far as not being able to go. So I got a red shirt that year. So essentially, yeah, I wrestled very few matches the first year. Um, I think I went two and two. I think I took fourth. I know. I, I think I went two and two at the Ohio open that year. So I, I didn't wrestle very much. You know what I mean? My first two years. Um, so, but, but you can see why, right? I, I, I was this injury. I didn't want it to hold me back because I had a whole year already where I didn't get to compete and I really wanted to be in that lineup, but it didn't happen. So, um, so yeah, so that was that yeah, those, those two years, I didn't really compete that much. So going into your third year, right? You're a sophomore, you're a redshirt sophomore. Mm -hmm. Do you make the starting lineup right away? Yeah. Yeah. We, there was going to be another wrestle off and then Corey left. He left the program. Um, I think it was the end of the semester. So he left. So then, we never had the wrestle off that year. We had. And he had you know, he qualified for the NCAAs, Eric. He had, yeah, he had been an NCAA okay. qualifier, yeah. So moving forward, you're the, the guy ranks, now. Are you the guy at this point? Yeah, yeah. So at that okay. point, I think we split a couple of matches earlier that year, and at the end of the semester, he left, and then I was in the lineup at that point. Um, so yeah, um, that that was the year I went. Um, I, I took fourth in EWL. I think at the time we were taking 40, 41 qualifiers. Um, we had Penn State. Penn State was in there. So, we, we, you know, we were taking a fair amount of qualifiers for the NCAAs. So, I qualified. I lost to um, I lost to Dan Vidlat from Oregon. And then he lost to Donnie Heckle from Clemson. They both became All-Americans that year. But that was when you had to follow your guy, right? So All the way to the, lost, to the semis or the finals, I forget. I think he had to win his next match, I think. I think Vidlex, he, hey, he, Vidlex, a eye doctor now. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. So you lose yeah. to Vidlex and he's at Oregon, right? Yeah, he was at Oregon. Yep. So the and two then, guys, and he lost. It. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Then I, I believe he lost that to Hackle the next round from Clemson, and both both of them wound up being all Americans that year. I lost two nothing to Vidlex. And I ended up eating Dippin' Dots the rest of the weekend. Up, in, It was in Maryland. My dad and my brother drove all the way to come watch me in the NCAA tournament, and they watched me wrestle for seven minutes, and we all ate popcorn and Dippin' Dots together for the rest of the tournament. I'm, like, throwing popcorn, seeing if my brother can catch it. It's like, oh, there's a good match going on over there. But it sucked. You know? Was the old man pissed? Um, was Ron pissed? No. No, not at all. He was pissed because you, you know how my dad was. And he's like, you didn't do it. You didn't score any points. You lost two nothing. I mean, he was pissed about that, but then, you know, he let it go. We ended up having, I felt really, really bad about, about them traveling all that way. I, I, I just, it just didn't sit well with me and, and, uh, you know, but, but I got better because of it. Right. I sat there, I watched wrestling the whole weekend. It's what they tell these kids, you know, they go to these tournaments and they get beat and they want to leave. Hey coach, can I go home with my mom? I'm like, well, yeah, you can, but I don't know. Maybe I, I, I'd stay. Maybe watch the guy that goes on the podium that you beat this year. Whatever. You know what I mean? Maybe whatever you can use to fuel your fire, right? Um, because I had no choice. It wasn't like Coach Bob was going to, you know, it's 1990. What's he going to Uber me back to Clarion? Or, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm sitting there, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so you're 0 and 1 at the NCAAs the first time you make it in 1990 as a redshirt sophomore. Going into junior year, did you feel like it's not going to be an all in one year? Did you feel like it could be the year? Yeah, I felt like I was pretty good. Um, you know, we were, in a, we were in a tough league. You know what I mean? I had the likes of Roselli and, and Prescott and Simpson and, and Tim Casey. And, you know. Um, that was your league? Yeah. That yeah. was the Eastern Wrestling League then? Yeah. And you then, had and then, Lou Roselli, Jeff Prescott, and who were the other two? Bobby Simpson was a four-time Pennsylvania runner-up. He was at Pitt. Um, and oh, that's right. Tim Pitt Casey, was in there. Was WVU yeah. in there too? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my God! You had Penn State, WVU, Pitt, Edinburgh, Lock Haven, Bloomsburg, Clarion, Cleveland Clarion, State. Cleveland State. Was was East Stroudsburg or any other? Or they were in the region? No, no, that was the that was the eight. That was the eight. You got yeah. you got the eight schools. Okay. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a league. Virginia Tech was in there for a cup of coffee in the like two or late nineties and two thousands, I believe. But anyhow, yeah, that was that's a that's great league. Fun. Wow. And then you were yeah. dealing with Roselli and Prescott. Yes. Oh my god. And then, like I said, then you had the guy like Steve Millward from WVU. He was very good. Um, it just it was a it was a tough league, man. And Lock even always had a guy. My my senior year, um, no, the next year after the Lock Haven dude, All American, the year after I graduated, uh, what was he was very good. He's tough. Hey, Eric, but anyhow, so Eric, did you have to know? Did you know going into the EWL tournament what place you had to take, or were there wild cards? Like, how did it work in ninety, ninety one, ninety two? How did it work? So, yeah, play? if I recall correctly, because dude, I, I took fourth, fourth, and third. Okay, and I, I was never a wild card. All right, so I, my understanding was we, I think we had, we were allocated anywhere from 40 to 42 wrestlers, I think, back then, right? And that was before Penn State bounced, right? Because Penn State, they would get eight to ten, eight to nine guys, ten guys to NCAAs every year. Okay, you know, so hold on. They bounced your, did you, you had to deal with Prescott at the EWLs in 92, didn't you? Yes. Yes. Wait, say it again. I missed what you just said. What? I, I didn't wrestle him because I got piss pounded by a guy named Tim Casey in the semifinal. But the point is, Penn State was in the league your last year. Their first year in the Big Ten was 93, is my point. Yes. So you had to deal with them all five all, all five years you were at uh, Clarion. You had Penn State in your league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were good. <laughs> Uh, I think everybody just assumes like it's such a recency bias, right? Like people just don't know, right? They just assume Penn State's been like a core member of the Big Ten, and they and they got in in the early '90s, and that's what people don't realize. Yeah. And everything like, people don't realize that. Yeah, they, they they were very good. They were typically I think they would be top four, top three. Um, you know, Iowa and Oklahoma State were very good then, um, but Penn State was right up in there, man. And they won our league pretty frequently. Um, the, my senior year, we were very good. I think that year we were ranked pretty high. We might have broke the top five at one point that year. We beat Ohio State, and then um, yeah, I think I think we beat Ohio State that year. Was that was that my senior? I can't remember. I get the my junior and senior sometimes get a little mixed up. But um, so t- we're in your junior year, so you get you get to your junior year. You're on one as a sophomore. Talk about your junior year at Clarion. Yeah, my junior year was was cool. I think we went down to Ohio State, and I, I won, and we won. We beat Ohio State. They were ranked pretty high. And then we drove up to Morgantown, West Virginia. We stayed the night, and we wrestled there the next day. And that's where I told my brother the story, because the same thing happened to my brother when he when he wrestled at West Virginia. And I'll let him tell you that story, but I, it's pretty much the same thing that happened to me. So I had a great day a couple days before I got a major against Ohio State come in we're wrestling west virginia i'm wrestling a pretty good guy back then they always started every match at 118 so we're at their place we go out i'm wrestling this dude something happens like first period i can't remember i honestly can't remember i end up on my back i get pinned right so i, I get up we go back to the middle every my, my coach is pissed everyone's like man bernie that sucks whatever so i shake the dude's hand and when he raised the dude's hand they got this mountaineer dude with like a real like gun like a the musket like a musket yeah and when they get a pin you know clang does like the gong thing yeah the guy blows off this musket like <laughs> and dude it scared the piss out of me like i'm shaking hands and the gun goes off and i'm like oh <laughs> so like the crowd's laughing <laughs> you know make cars over in the other corner like i'm like oh this is just horrible horrible your brother so, and you both got the musket at WVU. I love it. Ah! Yeah, it, it, dude, it sucks. Uh, yeah. So, you know, of course, I don't tell him that because I'm like, I don't want him to think I'm thinking, well, if you happen to get pinned, <laughs> this guy's got a musket over here. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it sucked. Watch out for the musket guy. You, don't, you shouldn't even be yeah. thinking about the musket guy, right? No, you should be thinking about winning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, we traveled. We went out to Arizona State. We had an amazing road trip. I mean, we really bonded. Okay, the guys, the guys, and you know how it is. It's like that on every team, basically, right? You bond. We went out to Arizona State. Um, we wrestled the Arizona State Open. We wrestled Arizona State. Um, I think we actually beat Arizona State that year. And then we, it was time to leave. And uh, so obviously you would know the difference between Arizona and, and Clarion basically in, in late November, right? Correct. As far as the weather, yeah. So, I mean, dude, I ran up that, I ran up that mountain that's in Tempe, like that overlooks the stadium. Yeah. So I went for a run and I ran up there and it's like an arid 85 degrees. And there's like a, I saw a jackalope, like it was like a, I, I, I was a jackalope. <laughs> it had not it, even a real it, thing. Stop it. It was it was dude, it was a rabbit, but it was like this tall. Stupid. <laughs> Maybe it was because it was above. Me. I don't know, but it was huge. Uh, <laughs> so we ran up up and down this mountain, and uh, yeah, and then somehow, oh, the Philadelphia Eagles were playing the Arizona Cardinals. Coach Davis just reminded me about this when 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 I got inducted in the Hall of Fame. He came in. He's like, Bernie, do you remember when I got you in the locker room to meet Jim McMahon? So Jim McMahon was quarterbacking for, I think, the Eagles, or maybe it was the, it was the Eagles at the time, I think. He knew the team doctor, right? So we take the van, the rental van, and we drive over to the stadium. No tickets. No nothing, no cell phones, right? So you can't like call the team doc and be like, yeah. "Hey, we're coming in." Can you get, dude? He, we, he finagled our way into the visiting team locker room, like, and and I got Jim McMahon's autograph. Like it's a, it's the craziest thing, dude. Like, just, Davis just knew how to. Uh, it, it oh, was, it's Jack Davis. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was on our road trip, right? So all these these little things that happen like you just and it's it's just it, you know and, and we we were just a good group and we, we just we had some justin kazemka's dad justin was like our 67 or maybe our 77 but but G, justin was another one he was kurt angle's roommate we all came in the same time right so his dad came out and picked us up and took us to like an indian reservation dude like a like a real one right i i bought a i bought like a poncho for like seven bucks. I mean, it was like <laughs> I'm flying around an airplane with my handmade Indian <sighs> poncho. It was it was just the best. So, <sighs> I, um, so you guys so yeah. bond on the trip. It sounds like a yeah. good time, but you got to go back actually, to Clarion. Or this, you know, knee deep snow, right? So 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 yeah, we go back to the hotel, right? And our flight is in like like I don't know three hours, whatever. So we're supposed to meet down in the lobby. I messed up the time. And they left, right? Like, so they jump in the vans and, 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 they, and they leave, right? And they're gone for like an hour. I go down to the lobby. I'm like, oh, wow. So once again, no cell phones, no beepers, no whatever, right? I'm like, beepers. all right. You know? So you know how you don't really think, right? Like yeah. you're not thinking, well, our room's been checked out, whatnot. I go back up to the room and I could still get in. So I'm just sitting in my hotel room like, wow, all right. I'm just going to be out in Arizona for a while. You know, and I was, dude, I was happy. Like, I'm like, I'm just going to hang out here. You know, I got like five bucks. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's like, fortunately, they spun the vans around, came back and picked me up, and I got to go back to Clarion. Um, and, uh, but yeah, just that, that was kind of me. You know what I mean? That's kind of yeah. the type of things that happen. So um, did you, you know, qualify? Every, did you qualify that year? Yeah. So that was the year. That was the year I, I qualified. So, yeah. So the year, a, a year or two before, I had lost to uh, Adam Derangowski from Ryder. It was at the Wilkes Open. He got on top of me, got the boots in, tortured me for a while, played with me, kind of like a cattle do with like a bug, like, you know, just kind of toy around and then pinned me. So um, I ended up wrestling not not poorly. Uh, I lost to Zapital first round that year from Iowa. Came back. I beat uh, I beat uh, a couple of pretty good guys. One of them was a guy from Michigan. So now I'm in the in the Oh, I, yeah, I beat the Michigan guy. Who was the Michigan the guy, do you remember? Uh, Salim Yaffe. Okay. It, it spelled Salem, but I think it was Salim, I, I think, Yaffe. And then um, and then I wrestled Perler from Oklahoma State. That was when I caught him in the barrel. Um, and uh, I, ended up, I ended up getting the pin. Which Perler? And 
not it was Nick. It was Nick. Tony, Tony was the it was the champ was the NCAA champion, right? Yeah, I believe so. The coach at Clarion. Yeah, t- t- Tony was bigger. I think. I think. I think it was Nick. Nick was really, really good, man. I just, I, you know, what I mean. So I, you I barrel rolled them and pinned him. Yeah. Where that were was you guys? the tournament? What's that? Where was the tournament at that year? That was well, it. Was it Carver Hawkeye? We got none. <laughs> You've been the Okie State guy. You probably, you probably thought you were an Iowa team, didn't you? Dude, it, was, it was absolutely banana, right? So that was when they were all wearing, like, the black – they they like they had, like, the striped shirts, like, black and gold and black and yeah, gold, yeah, right? Yeah. So that happens, and, like, this whole section goes nuts, right? Like, I'm just some – I'm just some dude from Clarion. Like, they're not rooting for me, right? Yeah, yeah. They're just I'm happy the Ocean State them. guy got pissed. Yeah. Right. Like, there's no delusions here. It's not like, hey, you know. <laughs> so, um, so that puts me in the blood round, and I got the Darren Gowski guy, who's just one of the best ever on top. Like, he and Roselli, what the things that they did to me when they got on top of me is criminal. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I figure, okay, I'll get a take down the first period. All right, get that takedown, that, 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 you know, we'll go from there. First period, no takedown. I'll go zero, zero. Um, second period, you know, I'm like, like, I don't Like, I was like, there before, like, they even looked at me, like, I won the flip. I was like, neutral, neutral, neutral. Like, just here, so here, sick. I'm here. I'm here. Here, here. You got me? You got me? You make no mistake. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I go neutral. I know I need to get a takedown. Working hard, didn't get a takedown. So, I was zero, zero. You were going so it's the choice and like he's like dude it's zero zero <laughs> you know what I mean? listen i hate to rub salt in the wound here because i know it's coming but <laughs> do you know you could have deferred i wasn't even <laughs> look i was like neutral neutral i it just it is what it is so, or maybe he deferred to me. I don't know. I, it I must don't have been that. I bet you it was I, I don't that. Remember. It had to have been that. I wasn't going down either way. Yeah. It was like, there's just no, no, no flipping way I'm going down. He went Mitch so, Clark. But that was though. being scared. What was that? He went Mitch Clark. Yeah, he did. And it, it, it that out. was even worse. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That was even worse because I'm like, ah, oh, great. You know? So yeah, I got, I got twisted up. I, I got turned three times. I got a riding point. Uh, beat me eight to nothing. So he did that in one period. Heard, it was zero yeah, zero. Oh, yeah. It was a horror show. It was a, just a just a horror show. I'm sorry yeah. to laugh, but you had you knew it was coming if you didn't get a takedown, right? Dude, I, I had okay. I, I had bad. I had bad dreams. I don't want to call them nightmares, but I had bad dreams. It, it actually it, it fueled what was going on from then on. Because man, sitting in that hallway at Carver Hawkeye. Knowing that I was there, like I was in the blood round, right? But because I was so piss poor on the bottom, I had no confidence. Okay, going to the third pit, none whatsoever. So I made it a point at that right then and there. And I'm like, I'm not going to be sitting here 365 days from now feeling like this. You know, not because of that. You know what I mean? Hey, if I put everything I can into this off season and I do everything I can do to become a national champion, and I'm still sitting here losing in the in the, in the blood round, I can deal with that, right? So, so that's what I did. It was, you know, and I had great teammates. Kurt Angle talked to me. You know, we had a couple of discussions about things, and I, I, you know, changed some things in my life. And you know, in my my senior year, man, I had to beat a really really good top guy in the in the blood round, and and I did. I got away, and I ended up winning the match. But it was a lot of work I put in in the off season to, for for that to happen. You know, and um, that's why. You know, right, the message that we always tell, tell tell the kids, you know, you you got to focus on your areas of weakness. Nobody likes to do that, right? It's no fun to work where you're not very good. Um, but but I did, and unfortunately for me, it paid off enough. I didn't win an NCAA title, but it paid off enough to where I was able to get over the hump. You know, did you, that one match. Did you make the quarters uh, your senior year, your fifth year? Yeah, yeah, I won my first two. I went. I, I was seated seventh, um, and. Um, yeah, that was the year, once again, I'm not sure I lost in EWL matches. Um, Prescott was wrestling up. Casey wrestled up. Simpson was wrestling up. And then at the end of the year, because the things were different back then, they, they decided to drop to 118. 
And I think Simpson may have gotten hurt and didn't wrestle in EWL. I lost to Casey. Casey always battled with Prescott. They always had close matches. He may have beaten him one year in EWL, Casey. Um, real long, hard to wrestle. But he beat me 10 to nothing in the semis. And then I dropped down and I beat, I think it was Elsass from Cleveland State. I beat a real close match with him. And then I wrestled Brian Slates from uh, Lock Haven and for third. So I took third that year. Uh, I got the seventh seed. I won my, won my first two matches, and then I had Zap it all again. And once again, I felt like I had prepared. I really, really felt confident um, as far as I, I felt like I had done what I needed to do. And then I proceeded to go out and reach with my left hand like five times in a row, and he just – basically posted and snatched my leg and just beat the piss out of me like 17 to 7, 17 to 6. Uh, so that was tough. You know, you lose in the quarterfinals and now you got to come back and you got to win. And, you know, I felt like I did a really good job of, of, of not having a rear view mirror after that match because it was, it was embarrassing, you know, and, and, um, and uh, I came back and I ended up, ended up winning and, you know, that, that got me on the podium and, then it was just about trying to climb at that point, right? Um, who did you so, beat the blood round? That, and that was in Oklahoma. And, yeah, and who did you beat uh, the blood round that year? Ty Moore from uh, UNC. So you beat Ty Moore. Had, he, he had abused. Yeah, he had abused me the year before at the Penn State duels. He got his boots in on me and just he just beat me up. So you got to um, beat a four-time, so, or yeah, he was a four-time state champ, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's really tough. Ty Moore um, was like the deal. So yeah, he was that was. He was yeah. legit. Um, yeah. Did you beat Ty Moore in the round in the blood round? And then did did Zappino wrestle Prescott in the title for the title? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He, he lost two. Yeah, he lost two nothing in the finals to Prescott. So Jeff Prescott won the way to guy in your league, and then the, the guy you lost to was runner up. Yeah, yeah, and Roselli redshirted that year. Okay. So I, I didn't have to deal with, with Lou that year. Um, so, but yeah, it was still a tough weight class. That was a year that Vidlak was hurt. Um, he, he was, he, I, I think he was in the weight, but he just wasn't the same guy. Um, he, he, was, he was hurt. Um, we, we, had, we, had a, we had a tough weight class, though. We had the kid, we had, we had Donnell Rawls from App State. Uh, and we had a third, um, didn't he? We took fourth. He knocked off Eric. He beat Aiken in the quarter and then lost to Prescott. And then they had a rematch, and Aiken beat him for third and fourth. Because Rawls beat me in the Concy Semis. Rawls had a, had, a, had a wicked nice takedown on me in the last five seconds of the match. He beat me by a point. And then um, – so, so I dropped down for fifth and sixth. Who did you beat for fifth and sixth? I, I wrestled a guy named Kevin Canan from Cal PA. And Kevin, he lives in – he's from Michigan. His son came to our camp last summer. I remember. I remember. Yeah. I was there. So, because I ended up going to Cal PA, I went to Cal and coached for that that semester after I graduated from Clarion, and I, I worked with Kevin because he was two years younger. Than me. So I went to Cal PA, and he and I were workout partners. And uh, he's, he's he's a friend of mine. He's a good dude. That's um, crazy. Yeah, pretty wild. Small world. What do you think it says, Eric? Like we're, we're we focus ultra on being D one All Americans. It's like all these the ultimate thing, and that's like the big biggest pressure item. And you know, like I don't feel like I feel if you're able to All American, whether you're a four time state champ or not, I I don't feel like that's an underachieving thing. I think everyone, I think everybody's delusional if they think every four time state champ is going to go in and win an NCAA title. You're you're not in touch with reality, right? Let's just let's get that out of the way, right? I just, I think it's, I think it's hard to be an All-American at any level. So hard. I just, I, so I hard. Way. You know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be that guy with, with low expectations or anything like that. I mean, yeah, there's the guys out there that can get it done and they get it done right away and they live right and they do everything right. And, and that's, that's them. And that, to, 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 that, that was Kurt. You know what I mean? That, that, that was Kurt. You know, he, he did things right and, and he had success. Maybe, you know, maybe not, the success he had immediately, you know, his, his freshman year, it wasn't like his senior year, obviously, but, you know, he just did things right. And then you got the wackos like me who have to learn the hard way, who have to make mistakes. And invariably then, it, then the pressure comes, right? So now you're dealing with pressure because, well, wait a minute, I, I, was, a, I was a state champ. I was, I'm supposed to be doing better than this. 
right? And so then, you know, that, that pressure kind of takes over. So you start doing dumb stuff and maybe you're not living right. You know, and, and I was proud of what we did at Clarion, not just as a team, but what we did, like what, what, what the coaches did with me as far as to get me all the way spun around 360, like being confident again, doing all the right stuff, leaving no stone unturned, you know, and I don't know, like I said, I was fortunate enough to become an All-American. Um, you know, I, I knew I wanted to coach. I think, I think becoming an All-American gave me more confidence as a coach. I'm not sure I needed an All-American to be a coach, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I think, yeah. it, you know, it just gave me a lot more confidence because I, I had lived what I'm about to tell these kids, right? I mean, even my junior year, my junior year, man, I felt like I pulled out almost all the stops and came up short. So I lived that, right? So I can talk to the kid who, who comes up short, right? And then, you know, even though I came up short my senior year by not being a national champion, um, which is what I trained for, but that one match, that hump match, the one I didn't win the year before, I won that one, right? So I had kind of both both sides of it. So I, I feel like that gives me some knowledge and, and – um, some some what some some credibility I guess when you're talking to these kids, I don't know. I mean, know. I've always I've always known your story, right? So mm -hmm. I I know your deal. So I I understand. I knew the struggles, right? I knew what happened that first four years to you, and I knew I, I knew you, right? Because you know, I'm, we're Scotty and I are the same age. You and Fur are the same age, right? There's ten years between us, so that we had that going, and that's why our families became so close, right? And I knew your story. So I always knew your credibility. I knew your, I knew the whole situation, right? How do you think you rode yeah. this into such a successful high school coaching career? And, and, and how do you, what were the stops along the way between Clarion onto Illyria high school? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, networking is so important and, and the networking I was doing wasn't intentional. You know, when I left Clarion, you know, Sheldon Thomas is another guy that really gave me a lot of confidence as a coach. You know, when Sheldon came into Clarion, uh, I had him on his recruiting trip and, and um, you know, we, we just, we, we clicked, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I left, I went to Cal PA for a semester and then I came back to Clarion. So I got to continue to work with Sheldon and he made me feel really good as a coach. He, he, he told me I helped him a lot. And, you know, um, so I, I felt like, you know, when it was time to make that move, to, as my best friend put it, when it was time for me to get the grown-up job and, you know, move, move back to Ohio. And, and I felt like I had a lot to offer. And through some connections with, you know, there was an attorney in, in, in our county named Jim Burge. And then, of course, Mark Moses' dad, Mike Mose, um, they, they had kids that were going to go to Amherst and that they had a coaching opening in Amherst. And there was a potential position within the court system where I, might, where I could maybe get hired there. So the timing was right for me to move back to Lorraine County. Um, you know, I got to be closer to my parents and I got thrown into a situation where I could be an assistant coach. I was over at Amherst Steel with coach Bill Walker and he did all the head coaching stuff. And all I had to do was come in and run workouts. And um, my dad had a, a kid he coached, the Wolf kid um, at West Shore. His dad, Russ Wolf, he had a company and I needed a job in the interim. Um, before I got, before I was going to get hired. So they got me a job in there. Um, I was actually cleaning like lathes, machines. So and wait, then wait, 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 one wait. night a guy left. You were doing, you were doing essentially like what Ron was doing, right? You were doing what your dad so, was doing. No, originally, man, the guy, uh, Mr. Wolf just like created a job for me. He, like I was climbing up on the lathes and it was like dusty and I was like wiping them off, right? And because it was supposed to be a short stint, right? Yeah. Well, then I don't know if a guy walked up. It was nights. It was 10 to 10. I worked 10, 8, 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. And I was living with Bill Walker in Rocky Rip. And the, the factory I was working at was in Avon Lake. So I would work 10 to 10, get off at 10 in the morning, drive to Walker's house, sleep for a couple hours, get up, and then I would go to Amherst and run wrestling practice. So um, anyhow – one night a guy kind of walked off the job, I guess. And so John was our supervisor. He was the guy down in the office and he comes down and get a, he had a thick German accent. 
he tells me to come down off this ladder and he's like, you're going to run this late. And I'm like, guys go to school for this. I don't know how to do this. And he's like, oh, I, I program for you and you, you run it. So I did that. And, um, I was pretty slow and John got mad at me and which pissed me off. So then I got faster and, um, I ended up being okay at it. And I, I actually had an opportunity. I could have stayed there. Um, but when the job opened up with the court, but that's where my dad was like, Hey, you know, now's your opportunity. You can go get this job over here at the group home. You're going to have the hours freed up that you need to coach kids. And so I fortunately listened to my dad and I went that direction, which led me into what I'm doing now. I went from being a child care worker for about 12, no, about 15 months. Then I had, there's an, uh, an opening to be a probation officer. I applied, interviewed, got that job. And then about a year and a half later, um, I, Mark McGuire was the athletic director at Illyria. He had come over from Illyria Catholic. He approached me about coaching at Illyria. Um, and I didn't want to at first. We were building in Amherst, and I wanted to be an assistant coach. But he was very persistent, and he stayed on me throughout the summer. And I ended up taking the job, the coaching job at Illyria. And then a year later, I got hired in as a homeschool liaison. And that was in. So I took the coaching job in 97, and in 98, I got hired in at the school. And you, you're still in that same homeschool liaison position, correct? Still the same title, but yeah, it's morphed. It, it's it's morphed into some other things, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great gig, great job. Okay. You enjoy it, obviously, and you enjoy working with the kids of Valeria, Ohio, right? Oh yeah, man. You know the people that have been around for the the people that I've been around for the last twenty five years. We talked about it earlier, six hours ago, right? We talked about. You know what I mean? All the guys that are from Elyria that aren't our yeah. coaching staff, right? You I mean, coach it, it, all it's those like guys. the pride. You that, all those guys. You, you coached them. They were on. They were athletes for you. So no, no. Chidlaw was gone before I came in. Dan Bottomley. Um, I coached Dan's little brother, Alec, and Dan. Dan has been a volunteer with me for twenty five years. Like the whole time I've been here, Dan. Unbelievable. Been here. Right, right. You know, Toby Workman. You know, all, all these guys. Matt Cannon. Right. Okay. So Mike Fenton is on our coaching staff. He did not, he did not go to the area. So yeah, he went to He's South. from PA. But, did you know that? Yeah. He's a big Pittsburgh fan, man. Yeah. Big Steelers fan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know he's a Steelers fan. I know he's from PA. Oh, uh, he loves the shirt. This, this year was rough. This past fall was rough, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and his kids were so, all state champions for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Peyton just took third last week. Had a great turn. That's a tough weight. Yeah. It's a good weight. Yeah. Yeah, really good he had weight. a pretty tough draw first round. He, he, he threw a guy named Jackson Joy. Yeah, he's yeah. a state champ. Yeah, and he battled. You know, he went 84. And his brother he battled. His brother was a three time finalist for your two time champ, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he's at he's currently at Kent. Okay. So you get all these people. How do you get the program to where you guys are in the hunt to win the state title? I mean, how many top five finishes did you have in the tournament, in the state tournament? I don't know. I mean, the one year we were third, we scored 146 points or something. Oh that was the God. year that we were all nationally ranked. We, um, LaSalle and St. Ed's, I think, were top 10 nationally ranked. We were like 19th, I think. And so, yeah, we took third, scoring just a boatload of points. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we were, yeah, we were runner up three times in the individual tournament. We were runner up twice in the, in the state duels um, to get to that level. It was just belief, right? Everybody that was involved had a belief that we could, we could go there. And, and it, the most important people, obviously in the equation are the kids, you know, the kids and their families, you know, and there were some, there were some kids that moved in, but you don't have 14 guys that don't live in your town. Right. So, you know, you might have six or seven guys that are, transfers even though they've been in your program since they're little you know but then you got to have you got to have your homegrown guys right yeah. and 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 everybody managed to come together you know you, you, we had our matt whiteley's in the world i mean matt whiteley you know grew up on east side of Valeria. He, he and danny were thick as thieves they both graduated in 05 you know uh, whiteley took fifth in the state that year um he 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 he, he had a he lost 
in the district finals, he made a mistake on the edge of the map, okay, and lost and ended up in the same quarter with Dustin Schlater. And he lost 15 to seven to Schlater. I don't know if you remember that, but it's. I remember it because Slater was um, buzzsawing everybody, and they're like, "This Illyria guy's pushing him." Yeah, he he was he was in the match, like it was you know, and and it was, but but it once again, you know, Whiteley started wrestling junior high, Um, so it was a bunch of people that came together, man, you know, and and they they believed in each other, and then you start adding guys, you know, Chidlaw jumped on the staff, I think in '06, Jack jumped on in '05. I might have that incorrect. I might have it backwards. Paulie Felton moved back from Florida jumped on staff. He was our first state qualifier in our area of era of coaching. Um, you know, it, it just was, you know, a bunch of guys that, that, that believe, you know what I mean? And, and, um, you know, to, Toby Workman didn't have much wrestling knowledge at all, but his sons wrestled. So Toby learned right along with his sons, you know, and, and he knows enough where I feel like he's comfortable or I feel comfortable having him in a chair. If he's not comfortable with the situation, he's like, yeah, I'd rather sit this one out, whatever. You know what I mean? But then everybody helps in some capacity. You know what I mean? We go to a state tournament. Toby's back at the hotel. He's on the foreman grills. He's making food for the kids. Um, it's just everybody. Chilaw works super hard on our schedule, right? Jack's Jack. Jack's Jay, literally, literally jack of all trades like jack <laughs> helps run the practices helps design the practices does the lifting program you know he's like, there um jack's you always don't, you there don't... you can always count on jack yeah man yep hey i want you to think about so, this think about this talk about the toby workman's like how imp- i don't think people they they undervalue the the toby workman's right they under i mean you can't undervalue the jack gillespie's but the toby workman's of the world who are just a plug-in utility player such a valuable person. I just don't think people get it. He, he's huge and he balances things nicely. He's got a great life. He's got a great fiance. He's got, he's got a great family and he balances it very well. You know what I mean? And then you got a guy like TJ Halstead. He's a young guy. TJ could be doing a lot of other things, but he's here coaching kids. He's helping our high school kids. Right. And TJ was a good wrestler. He was a good heavyweight wrestler in high school for us. He did a match or two from going to state. Um, but he's been with us now for a long time. He was a partner for Bo like when Kevin was here, you know, and now he's involved with our youth program on Sunday mornings. You can find him over at North Olmsted high school, helping out our OYWA youth kids. It's like, you know, th- these are guys, once again, a Leary graduate takes a lot of pride in what we're doing. Right. And, and, and you know, him and Polly and myself had a great, great time together this year with the OYWA. Um, but it's just a really cool group. You know, we get on a group tax, you know how it is. You know, there's always guys cracking jokes, and we'll argue. We'll argue on the group text about what we should be doing, about our schedule, things like that. But that's what you need, right? You don't want to have seven, eight, nine yes men. You want guys questioning what you're doing all the time, you know, and, and that's why this group is so special. Think about, like, a guy like a Johnny Pycraft. I remember his junior year, he was with you. He, like, didn't finish the state tournament. It was, like, bizarre what happened, right? Mm-hmm. And he like crawled under the apron and right through so that whole thing. Right. Remember that? Yeah. It was bizarre I what happened. And I'm like, this guy's trajectory is nowhere. Right. I'm like, and, he, and it was like trajectory. I don't think he would have won at Keystone where he was. And then he just like goes on this massive, crazy run and wins the state title. Was it 06 or 05? When did he win? 06. He and, he and, uh, he and Stevie both won it. Stevie was a 10th grader that year. Stevie Mitchell, Johnny was a senior. Yeah, Johnny went to Ironman. I lost two matches at Ironman. I think he went two and two, in large part because he was afraid, because we had way outs at that point, I think, that year. And he, he, was, he was nervous about not making weight, so he didn't eat. And it was a lesson learned, because he didn't lose the rest of the year. I mean, he went, I don't know, he won 28 matches in a row or something. He won Braxville. He, won, he just went nuts. Um, he won a state title. It was, it was amazing, but what, he, crazy what he learned story, from it, though, that whole, the whole, well, the, John, it's the most unlikely thing ever, right? Well, just this mental, the mental strength that he, that he learned. Okay. Because he got, he was mentally weak. His junior year at the state tournament, he was mentally weak, you know, and, and he figured that out. He didn't want that to happen again. Right. He didn't want it to happen again. So he made sure it did. And that was amazing. You know, they have these yeah. crazy meltdowns, remember? Yeah. And it would like yeah. he would literally melt down, punch people, go nuts, right? 
Well, when he was little, yeah, he, yeah, he, he would. But, but like I said, even in in the high school, there would be those moments where it would be like, oh man, you know. And that that's kind of it started at the district tournament because he, he was beating. It was the Perrysburg kid who was wrestling, and he had a lead on the guy. And then they they actually they cracked heads, and everything was it wasn't intentional, but you know, Johnny started to get really anxious and whatnot, and he ends up losing that match. And then they wrestle at state and that might've been a blood round or I think, I, I, no, I don't know if they placed eight at that point, but they placed eight. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they, did. They, did. They, did. they did. So it, it was probably the blood round and he just wasn't functioning. Like he got hit in the head again. And, um, but man, I mean, the lesson that he learned, it was just amazing. It was amazing. In that so thing. He, and that, probably that, had con- he probably had concussions is what the thing about it is. Like I'm sitting here saying he melted down. He probably had, con- it's like if he probably was concussed, right? I mean, we don't even yeah, I don't know, know that. I don't know. It's wild. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you get over the hump, right? And you guys are rolling, right? Like you get over the hump, you get your first couple state champs. Now you got these teams. You're able to compete in the state duels. And I don't know if it was 2014, 2015, 2016. You're yeah. right there to win a title, right? Mm-hmm. Was it 16? Was that the year? Yeah, I think it was – Fifteen, we were second in both, I think. And then, what's 16. the year you lost by like under ten points? I don't remember. I don't know if we were. I don't know if we were that close. I don't know. Twenty twenty, we were runner up in the state duels. Of course, we didn't have a state tournament that year. Twenty nineteen, I think was the year we were third, but that was the free show year when uh, LaSalle and Eds, I think, was. That was a great run. That was a great race. But you had a great race. You were in a great race that year. You guys were runner up. You're, I think your last year's runner up in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, the one year we went nine and zero in the first round. <laughs> I mean, oh it was. God. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was just amazing, you know. Um, That's crazy just, to think about it. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, what do you think your legacy is? You know, you guys. We're right there so many times. You're so close. You built this. It was organic. Did it in a community where your wife is from and you're a neighboring community too. What do you think the legacy of, of Eric Burnett and Illyria Wrestling and Ohio Wrestling is? As a well, I, I, hope it's, yeah, I hope it's a little bit like what, what, what my coaches did for me. You know what I mean? It's like I, I, always, I always believed in our kids, in our program, but in our kids really. It's like, you know, guys are – we got guys that are good, good family guys right now. They're good fathers. They're good husbands. There's guys out there flying helicopters. There's guys, you know, uh, doing so many cool things with their lives and the winning is cool. You know, it, it, it's cool. And, and I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Jeff Lyons and I, I, we communicate here and there. And I, I'm glad, I hope that, I hope that the alumni is proud. And, you know, from when I talk to Jeff, that's what he says. He says that you know the wrestling alumni is very proud of, of what we've done, and, and that means a lot to me. Um, my dad, my uncle, both went to Elyria High School. I know my uncle was proud of what we did. You know, he told me all the time. You know, and I mean, Coach Pearson, who has the only state championship, he was the head coach here. Um, his son is Clay Wenger. He's the current head coach at Wadsworth. You know, Coach Pearson has written me a note here and there. Just you know, so that kind of stuff is really cool. But you know, it's very cool. But ultimately, it's always about the kids. You know, and we have a bunch of guys that I feel like got out of our program and our our school what they were supposed to get out of it. You know, even the kids that maybe didn't have the success they thought they would, um, some of the guys that maybe, you know what I mean, weren't as coachable as as you wanted them to be, they're now living pretty good lives, really good lives. You know, and 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 it'll come back and you'll talk to their dad, and their dad will be like, I know he was a little tough to deal with sometimes, but he's applying what he learned from your coaching staff to his life right now. And he's 28 years old. He's 29. He's living the right life. I mean, that that's everything. It's everything. You know? Your son's being a part of it, right? Like you really believe in this that much that you, you put your sons in it. You live in the town. You live not too far from the school. Having your sons a part of what you've created at Elyria. What was that like having Nate and then uh, Mick, right? Having the two boys, the Burnett boys, both be multiple time state placers, um, mix uh, state champ. Nate had a really good tournament this weekend, right? 
with the bomb wheel, but battled, right? I mean, how proud are you? And what's that mean to have your sons be a part of what you built at Illyria? Yeah. Well, I mean that, yeah, that's, it, it Nate, Nate's a battler. That's one that I'm going to say, you know, that, that dude, he's never backed down from anybody, not ever. Right. And, you know, I, I'm just, I'm really proud that, you know, he made the choices, whether he was going to wrestle or not, you know, after he lost in the semis, I, I didn't know what he was going to do. You know what I mean? It was, I'm like, hey, it's up to you, you know, and, and he, he went and he, and he wrestled and there was no, no, no psychological shenanigans from me to him or anything like that. You know, it was like, do whatever you want to do. And he did. And, it, and I'm glad that it worked out pretty good for him. Um, but he, but he's tough. Right. And I think that it's going to bode well for him in the future. You know, and he knows he's got things to work on to be, to be a good college wrestler. He knows, but you know, um, I just, that, that, so, so it's always been fun to coach my kids. Right. And I'm glad that for six years I had at least one of my sons in our program with us at the high school level. But I feel like the last three weeks or month, you know, since when, when Nate got hurt, it was trying, it was challenging, but I think we grew. Okay. Maybe not just as a coach wrestler, but as a dad son type of thing, you know what I mean? And I, I think that helped us grow. Um, you know, when Mick was in high school and I, dude, I missed a lot of the youth and junior high wrestling. My wife, Janet, was taking him to Virginia Beach, was taking to all this stuff, was getting a, a junior high schedule together with all the better kids in the area and going to wrestle all this stuff. I was missing a lot of it, right? So I just felt so fortunate that I could be at everything when they were in high school. And, and we knew that, at, which made it easier when they were younger. It made it easier for me to say, Say, okay, Jane's going to take them and I'll do the high school stuff and whatnot because I, I knew I was going to going to have that chance with them. Um, but yeah, look, man, my kids chose to wrestle. There was no guarantee they were going to do that. They, you know what I mean? Nate picked wrestling over baseball like in eighth grade. Um, he was pretty good, at, pretty good at baseball. So I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, and, and we never, the one thing we were never going to do, right or wrong, I'm not saying what I did was right and what Ken and I did was right, but wrestling was never going to come between you know our, our, us our relationship you know if it wasn't going to be anything about weight cutting it wasn't going to be anything about go this practice that practice going to this tournament whatever you know it was always going to have to somehow be their idea right and because that's the way it all started out they decided to wrestle janet would say well we're going to go you know they're five years old you know, dad's running practice uh, I'm going to go up there. Okay. And they tag along. They'd come up there and they'd screw around. The next thing you know, they wanted to wrestle. You know, that just, it worked out. I, I couldn't have been more blessed or lucky, however you want to put it. I just, man, I'm very fortunate. Both at Clarion now? Or, I mean, sorry, Nate's not at Clarion, right? Yeah, he, he will be. Yep. So okay. Mick's already there and Nate will be joining. What's it like? knowing that they're where you were, man, where you grew up and became your second formative life and where you became a man. So Mick's been up there now since January and knock on wood, Clarion seems to be doing for him what it did for me. You know what I mean? Just the, the, the way the coaches are there, um, you know, the, the way they've, they've tackled the situations with Mick, the way they're helping him. He's happy. You know what I mean? I, I just, I feel, I feel very, very fortunate that he's in that situation. Now he's going to go whatever, to whatever level he wants. Right. Um, it, that, that journey. Yes. I'm here. I'm a, I'm a text away. I'm a phone call away, whatever. I'm a zoom away, whatever. He, um, if he needs help with anything, of course I'll try to help him, but this is his journey, you know, and he's, he's going to figure it out. If he wants to be a, a, a national champion or an All-American, then he's going to have to get with his coaches and figure out how to make it happen. I want him to – my 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 thing, of course I want him to succeed in wrestling and, and reach his heights, anything he says. I want him to have a college degree, and I want him to be employable, and I want him to have a job that he want, likes likes to go to every day. You know, um, and I want him to pay his bills so he's not coming home and trying to live in my basement. You know, it's – uh. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I like having him around, but, you know, yeah, he needs to be, he needs to get out of college, but you're supposed to get out of it, you know? And I, I think, I think being at Clarion is, I think is, is going to work out for him. 
you know, if they, and Nate, Nate, there's never been a doubt. Nate, Nate never looked at anything. Else. Now we went out because we, we, I think the world coached Jeff Reese. So we went and we looked at um, Lake Erie and then we left there and we were just taking a little family trip. It was, you know, Joey Blaze and Nate, they're thick as thieves. They're tight. So Joey went with us and um, we ended up leaving. We left, we, we visited Lake Erie. Um, of course, Joey wasn't really, we wasn't visiting. He just happened to be taking along. And then we went up to um, Cook Forest. We spent a weekend up there and we stopped in Clarion. Of course, it's during COVID. We couldn't get in the building. We couldn't get in the new facility. We're like looking in windows and stuff. And we went and had breakfast at the county seat in downtown Clarion. And Nate's like, this place is great. And um, yeah, we went and checked it out. I ended up calling Coach Ferraro and I said, Nate is really interested in you guys. And that was it. We made it work. He never visited anywhere else. So so I think I think Clarion's the right place for Nate, right? And obviously time's gonna tell, but um so things things look positive right now. Mick started out at Pitt. Do you think the big city um didn't suit him as well as now the small burg in um Pen- uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, I I just think there were a lot of things. Uh I, I think you know, I, I, he wasn't in the right mindset. Um, you know, when he was at, when he was at Pitt, he, he just he just wasn't. And you know, great coaching staff there. I, I think the world of those guys. And I, I just you know, for 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 some reason, it just wasn't it wasn't the fit. Um, you know, lots of online stuff going on at that point. Um, I'm not sure his mindset was right at that time. No, they were they were living in a dorm and not going to classes, right? Yeah, it just um, it just wasn't a great situation, you know. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there's other. Well, that's guys not on pit. That's every. That was everywhere. <laughs> well, that's what I'm right, right, and, I, and I'm not sure that that in, that situation was was good for Matt. Yeah. Um, because of where he was, he wasn't in the right mindset, and and now, like I said, you know, being in a different situation, going to class, being in a smaller environment, I I think it's I think it's working out better for him, you know. So. All right. So speaking of people that have lived in your basement. <laughs> your brother Scotty. Mm-hmm. Um him and I talked this weekend and you know, he got so, uh, pretty emotional but um and they had a they had a great run that you know lost they're within St. Edward 10 points. We're in the lead a couple times in the finals we're in the lead. Yeah. Perrysburg but Scotty was in a rough. He was in a, in a in between a rock and a hard place in his twenties, right? And and you know he talked about you in the interview. I know you haven't seen it, but he just talked about how you you guided him along, you loved on him, and you you just kind of told him he had to go do his own thing, and he figured it out. And he had a horrible thing happen to him with one of his girlfriends. Um. And and then I think from at that point, what what changed for Scotty Burnett, and how has he become an elite coach in your estimation? You're you know you're you're ten years older than him, and you're, he's your little brother. But how proud are you, and what's what changed for Scotty Burnett in his life? Well, he's he's been all in. You know, there, there was a time when he was he was in. You know what I mean? But he was he was in and out. You know what I mean? And and then you know he 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 became all in. He he ended up you know he did some work with us at Illyria, and then. Then he moved out to Wauseon and he was all in there, right? And then, um, and then he ended up jumping over to Perrysburg and he was all in. You know, was he for a million for a for a hot minute there too. Yeah, he, yeah, he was he was ever million, okay. for a million for a year or two. Um, so but it, you know, and, and Jody, Jody's been huge. Um, you know, jo, Jody's just just you know, um, should, like we talk about Janet, right? It's like, and that that's. You know, Jody's been huge for Scotty and, you know, they're, but, but the buy-in, he's completely bought in. Like what, what's going on at Perrysburg? Those, the, everybody is buying in, right? Well, a number of years ago, Scotty bought in, you know, and was like, this is what I want to do. And, you know, once you get a guy like that with, with his talent, coaching, and dealing with kids and people and things like that, and that buy-in is completely there, the, the sky's the limit. You know, and but you can't push somebody into that. You know what I mean? When when Scotty, he spent a couple of months here at my house, at our house with us, and I 
I would just say, Hey, can always, I can use the help. You want to, you want to come up to the practice or whatnot, you know, and he, you know, and, and I, but I think it was important for him though, to do his own thing, right. To not necessarily be with me. I think, I think it was important for our, for our dynamic for, for Scotty to go do something, you know, somewhere else. Um, not that we don't enjoy working together. Hell, we do all these camps together. We do all this stuff together. But I think, I think it was important. And I, I think it's important for him to do his thing. It's like I told the guy the other day, one of the newspaper guys who does an amazing job, but he said something about, you know, Nate was in the semis and he said, you know, here's his chance to kind of join the Burnett tradition of winning state titles. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this is Nate's separate journey. Okay. I, I had a journey. Scott Burnett had a journey. You know, Mick Burnett had a journey. And now Nate's having a journey. It, it's like, you know, the state title was great for, for him if he wins it, but it, 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 he's not joining any kind of prestigious thing. You know, and, and, and I talked to both my sons about this, you know. Um, so, so Nate didn't win state this year, but I don't know. What if he's the first Burnett to, to get a master's degree as far as the male Burnett? What if he's the first one to, to get a doctorate? What if he's the first one to win an NCAA championship? I mean, you know what I mean? It's like everybody has their own journey. Yeah. Um, and that's just, you know, I told, I, you know, Scotty may be the first Burnett to get a team state championship, a gold yeah. trophy. You know, that, all that stuff is great, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's their, it's their own journey, man. My thing is I know how Nate Burnett feels, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm the same, you know, I was the same situation and, and what's wild with, <laughs> with me is I got, I got two nephews who are state champs. So, so look at this. I got, I got three brothers and there's like the turd in the punch bowl. Me, if you, if you, if you look at it, how people look at it, right. <laughs> right. You got the third right. in the punch bowl, uh, the non third in the punch bowl right here. And I got two nephews, right, who are state champ. Somebody asked me, mm-hmm. how, how many of you guys are state champs? And I said, well, they got six titles between five guys. Because, you know, Big Ferd's the. Yeah. Big Ferd's the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Big Ferd's the king. Big Ferd's the king. You realize it's the only thing I think Ian cared about is yeah. he didn't get the there match go, for right? the state title. That's all he cared about, right? But Ferd's a two-time yeah. state champion. Yeah. Else got a state title. Yeah. I was fifth, right? right. But I don't. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't feel like. Uh, I don't feel like I'm a failure in life. <laughs> right. Right. I don't think it defines me as a person. No, you you, you have your own niche. You know, if Correct. you think about athletics, you know, I believe you. I believe you're all state in two sports. Well, when, okay. You all state. We were seventh in the relay. But only top six placed them. Okay. In the four by eight hundred, we were seventh. We were seventh in the top six place, which now it's top eight. But this wasn't then. It wasn't top eight. I actually had this discussion with a girl I graduated yeah. from high school, Jennifer Suckus. She was like, "I was in the top eight every year," and I was like, "Hey, dude, I was in the top eight twice, and it just didn't happen." It's just how right. you score because you score. You score in the top right. eight in track. Good. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah, yes, to answer your question, yeah, and we were, we were uh, pretty good in football, too. Yeah, and it's really sure, right? It's, but it's high school sports. It's high school athletics. It's not about my accomplishments. It's what I learned. Yes. And how I apply them to life. Well, and, and that, that's exactly what, you know, and, and we circle back to what we were talking about before. Like, the most important thing that we did as a coaching staff was get people ready for life, right? That's it. And – you know, it's their own journey and they're going to do a hell of a lot of good things and they're going to make some mistakes too. And, you know, it's how they come out in the end, you know, down the road. We and get caught most, up in most, winning too much. I think winning yeah. it just takes way too much precedent. And then when you have these people who are win, 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 and titles, 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 win, win, win. And then, and then when that's all over, they don't know what to do with themselves. A lot of them. Yeah. That's the well, sad part. Right. They well, missed out on what it was really about. I remember you put it on your flyers for Burnett Trained. Learn during the climb, right? Right. The man on right. the top of the mountain didn't just land there. Right. The climb is what it's about. Nate Burnett's journey is what it's about, right? Mick Burnett's well, journey I mean, look, about, yes. Right? And we, we used to talk about, like, the helicopter. Like, if I had five grand or whatever and I could have this dude put me in a helicopter, who knows what it would cost, might be more than that, and just – 
take me up in this helicopter and put me on top of the mountain, right? Versus the guy that has the seven day journey, right? Up the mountain. That, that dude that climbed that mountain, you know where I'm going with this all. Yeah. It's like, oh man, I learned that a viper you can make me almost die if I don't have the anti-venom. Oh, so I made sure, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, that boulder that almost landed on me. Geez, I'm no better than that. Yeah. It's like, you don't learn any of that. Right. Yeah. And if that's, the Sherpa that's the carries you up on Everest, if the Sherpa carries you all the way up, did right. you really climb Everest? <laughs> right, right. So Nate Burnett just took third in state, and he dealt with a lot of adversity this year, right? So he's going to learn. He'll be able to get through some some tough situations, right? And um, now I, I just it's it's always been about the journey, man. Always in each individual journey, you know. So what do I have to do as a dad to not run my kids out of the sport of wrestling and try and help them find a love? You cannot make them love it, but you can most certainly make them hate it. How do I make them not make it hate, make them hate it? How do I make them not hate wrestling? So it's, it's not about, it's not about like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You got to figure out how to make him thirst. All right. So we, went to a lot of tournaments and we did a lot of overnights and they would swim in the pool and they would, they would get their ice cream when the tournament was over or their dip and dots or whatever. I guess what I'm trying to say is it was always fun. Everything's fun. We went down to the super 32, Nate dog got his tooth knocked out in the match for third and fourth, whatever, and wanted to continue wrestling. Like I said, he's top, right? Ends up taking fourth, whatever we go over and we find all this medication to get him and, and then we go swimming and we have a blast. We've always made it fun, you know, and they are, uh, you know, Mick and Nate were pretty good. Mick, Mick ended up winning an OYWA state title. He won. You know, I don't think he ever won OECs in middle school. Um, Nate won OECs, but we always had fun. There may be that disappointment where they lose the match or whatever, but we always had fun, right? Practices, it was about commitment. You know, Janet dealt with them a lot because I would already be up there at the high school and she would bring them up for practices. So she would say, well, we, we committed you Tuesday and Thursday. This is what we do. Right. So, and, and they, they believed in that, you know, and it was, but it was always kind of like their idea, if that makes sense, you know? And like I said, never comes between you know us the sports don't come between us me i fortunate enough to wear the dad hat and the coach hat that was cool and every now and again we got it crossed up but typically we did okay with it so now man you let your kids somehow you make it their idea and you always make it fun a fun weekend a fun little trip it's always going to be good i love it do you have anything else for me do you want to tell like a kyle clear story <laughs> No, I'm all good, man. I'm probably going to go to bed. I am so tired, dude. I've never been on the log. This log with somebody, but I love it. I think it's all cold. <laughs> I think it's all a winner. Eric Burnett, thank you for the time. I'm going to uh, – well, hey, I mean, if you stayed on this long, at least go check out www.barbarianapparel.com. Coach Burnett, stick around for a little bit. Talk to you real quick, all right? 